Hello there. How are you? Welcome back to Kevin Pollack's Chat Show. I am, as always, Chat Show. Who are you? You're not buffering. We've missed you terribly. We've been away from uh, this place for a couple of weeks now. And you know what happened while we were gone? Apes took over. Apes did not take over, sir. Oh, shit. We got ourselves... Uh, another sponsor, and I would like to tell you right now that this chat show is being brought to you by Netflix. With Netflix, you can watch thousands of TV episodes and movies streamed to your PC, Mac, or TV instantly. Plus, get DVDs by mail in about one business day for a free, free 30-day trial. Go to netflix.com forward slash Kevin. How about that? How about it? We're helping people get free Netflix. I repeat, for a free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com forward slash Kevin. So we welcome them as a new sponsor, and I'm awful damn happy about it. We'll tell you more about their fabulous uh, stuff a little later in the show. But I wanted to mention that up top. We're very, very happy. I've actually been after uh, the idea of having Netflix as a sponsor since we started a couple years ago. So I'm very thrilled that the fine folks at PodTrack is helping us make this happen. A little shout-out to them as well. Um, two weeks gone. What the... Seriously, um, where have you been? We haven't heard from you. Oh no, that's on me. We uh, the first week we took off because uh, oh I had some shows on the uh, in the Florida, uh, the, the Nation's Wang I believe they call it on the Simpsons. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, mm -hmm. the Country's Wang. America's Wang. America's Wang. <laughs> I've got to get it wrong, otherwise it's not me. Right. Uh, we were in the Country's Wang, and uh, hmm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Something yeah. funny happened there? Ended up, right there. We ended up on a mermaid's chest. Um, boo. And That's then a, the second week you were gone because why? The second week? Yeah. Why second week in a row? Yeah, why weren't we here last week? Um, why weren't we here last week? Because you were still glowing from your New York success. No. No, it was West Palm Beach and then it was New York. It was in New York. I yes. was in New York. Ah, I had. thank you, Sam. No problem. I had to speak on a uh, panel for the NAB, for the NAB, for the uh, for that. Yeah, I had to speak on a panel and uh, talk to um, Chris Young from um, DBG, a wonderful company that is uh, a producing partner with Kiefer Sutherland on his new web series called The Confession, which I highly recommend. Holy shit, is this thing amazing? Um, I think it's on Hulu. Yeah, you go to the Hulu, you type in The Confession, and you watch yourself some of that. So that's where we were the second Sunday. Um, boy, was that not interesting at all. Uh, but uh, I just did want to comment a little bit on the, the odd feeling of being away two weeks in a row. It felt weird and wrong and uh, made me realize, A, how much I love doing the show, but also how much I enjoyed playing hooky as a kid. Because that never happened either, and when it did, holy shit, was it amazing. I'm actually skipping school. I had friends who skipped school all the fucking time. Could not skip it enough. I was like, really? How are you going to, how are you going to graduate, man? Was really one of those like, friends, how are you going to make it in life? Was one of those guys Richard Branson? Because he did okay. You was went to school in England, right? I did. Okay. Richard Branson skipped school? Actually, I believe he just straight up dropped out. Yeah, I did that. I dropped out of college or graduated as I like to call it, in nine months. You attended. I attended. <laughs> uh, so it felt really weird, though, to miss those two weeks in a row. Because the only time we missed two weeks, I think, is Christmas New Year's. We missed those two Sundays. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, this was just of our doing, and it felt wrong, like someone was going to call from the Internet and say, the fuck? Sammy. Yeah, buddy. You, before we get on to my incredible news, you... <laughs> Uh, went to a wedding in Paris. I did. During I the did. two weeks. Did. Went to a wedding. Uh, had some best man duties. You were the best man at a friend's wedding in Paris. Uh-huh. It sounds very sexy. It was fantastic. I did not know you were the best man. I, I indeed. Uh, Look at I, 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 It gave me the opportunity to grow this disgusting mm -hmm. thing, which um, I'd like the viewers to weigh in on. Are you, are you a lead guest star on Teen Wolf? Uh, Teen Wolf 3, back in action. Um, it's a TV series now. Is it? Yes. Oh, that's it's actually a drama now. That's a... It's not funny, nor with jo um, Jason Bateman. Oh, if Bateman were back. Yeah. Um, no, so, this is for a potential movie thing, which I can't talk about yet. Uh, <laughs> but I would like the viewers to weigh in uh, to tell me on a scale of one to ten, uh, zero or one being completely creepy, ten being never shave ever. 
Uh, okay, but back to your point about Paris. <laughs> Guess what? They don't like tourists over there. What are you especially saying? Especially American tourists. I'm sorry, are you saying that the French are not fond of Americans? I've never heard this before. I'd never heard it either, except for the last time I was there, when they screamed at me. I need to hear, because you tweeted something about being mugged. Yeah, their muggings there are amazing. Because organized? They're organized, they're state-run. It's awesome. What they do is... State-sanctioned muggings? Yes! Wow. What they do is they stop you on in down in the metro, in the subway when you have perfectly legitimate tickets, and they go, oh yeah, no, these aren't legitimate, you pay a fine right now, or we arrest you. And you go, no, come on, you're fucking with me. They go, no, here's our badges, which look like badges I could have bought for 99 cents at Target. How many of these muggers were Three. there? Three. And they were in uniform? Yes, a uniform. It was like sweatpants and a vest. And you gave them cash? No, I gave them a credit card. They took credit cards. That's how you know it's a weird, like, state-run mugging when they accept credit cards. Right there on the spot. Right there. They had this little deal, and the guy swiped it, now, and I screamed. Now, knowing you as I do, yeah. I'm going to assume, yeah. I'm going to tiptoe out onto this limb. Yeah, you go and ahead. And suggest that before you forked over your credit card, yeah. you had a conversation with them for about a half hour about it, how they were not going to take your money. It took a good half hour. <laughs> And what was crazy about it was the, uh, no, 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 you have to pay right now, we're gonna arrest you. That part of the conversation, the guy threatening me spoke perfect English. But this is illegal, this is extortion, I want you to show me where my ticket is invalid. He didn't understand a word I was saying. Really? Yeah, That's it was how crazy how that happened. <laughs> and what was crazy was, I saw that happening to a bunch of other people who did not speak perfect French. But uh, I'm sure that was just coincidental. Did you, mem did you mention your uh, being a member of the Inglorious Bastards and look what we did to the Nazis? You know, I tried to bring up that they would be speaking German if it wasn't for us. They did not want to hear it. By the way, I finally found out why they hate Americans. Why is that? It's because we saved their ass. Literally. Yes. They don't want to fucking be reminded of it. No. And it's like, we didn't need your help. That's literally why they hate everyone in America except for Jerry Lewis. Mm. Because they don't, want to, they don't want us to think that, we, that they needed us. No. Sons They're like an ungrateful stepchild. Uh, so other than the mugging. Other than that, state-sanctioned mugging. Your, your lady friend. Yes, my lovely Eve. Uh, um, and you went to Paris together. Yeah, it was wonderful. I gave you a little shit before you left, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. was unappreciated. Well, about uh, the romantic. We don't need to bring it up. The romantic nature of the trip. Sure. And maybe something might happen. Sure. But uh, did you do <laughs> what sort of? What was the highlight of the two of you together on the streets of Paris? Is there a couple of moments where you went, "Wow, this is really great that Eve and I are here in this moment." Every moment was wonderful. Jesus Christ. The highlights for really? me were the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> oh my God. Did you uh, go to the Eiffel Tower? Of course, you have to. Uh, that's we where took you're a, wrong. a beautiful. You don't no, actually no, have you to. You don't have to go to the Louvre. <laughs> that's where you don't have to go. Uh, unless you want to meet every American in Paris, right. don't go to the Louvre. <laughs> yeah. Um, we uh, we took a lovely boat ride up the uh, the Seine River. Mm -hmm. That you should do. That was gorgeous. You make any attempt at all to speak French at any point? Yes, actually, we spoke lots of French. Did you say l'addition? L'addition, s'il vous plaît. Yeah. Oui. That's the first thing the Jews learn to say. Check, please. Check, please. How much is that? Right. And where's the bathroom? Combien? How mm -hmm. much is that? Yeah. Don't the forget your don't forget your punchline. <laughs> Which one? Please don't arrest me. Please don't arrest me, right. <laughs> well, she's, we were just talking not... about how people tell the same stories over and over. That, yep. was, one of that was one of them. Yeah. And yet I left the punchline out. That was actually conversing. <laughs> Son of That's it. why I'm here. Um, Thank you, honey. I have some photos, but I didn't prep them, so I don't know if people care to see them. Uh, Put them I'll, on your Facebook page. I'll start tweeting them uh, now. Do you have a Facebook page? I do. Yeah. Everyone Let me does ask Sabrina me. if he has a Facebook page. I don't. Uh... Jamie? <laughs> You, uh... Can I tell a story about how I had to watch Kiefer Sutherland open mouth kiss the um, four elderly women? I think women? the time has come for this story. We were in New York, um, a story uh, involving Carnegie Hall, which I will share in a moment. Uh, prior to that, our first night there, uh, first day there, we went to a matinee of that championship season on the auspices of one Kiefer Sutherland. Mm -hmm. And then after the show, we went on the stage and chatted it up. And at one moment, some people had uh, uh, I was gonna tell a story. auctioned, I, I want to set the scene. They had auctioned for an opportunity. Please take it from there. Yes, they were auctioning. There was, um, the uh, Broadway collectively was um, collecting money for AIDS, was it? Sure. I think that's what it was. For or against? Um, I, I, it's always important you to can find never out tell. <laughs> you can before never you tell give them your money. No. They right. never say. But, so, they were auctioning off a bottle of wine that the cast had signed. And 
it was the auction was going, and then this one woman screamed, "I'll give you a thousand dollars if I get to kiss a uh, kiss Keith or Sutherland." Right. So she paid the thousand dollars and she came on stage and she got to kiss him and it they oh it was an open mouth kiss like they made out and this woman <laughs> was probably like fifty fifty and a troll I believe yeah she was probably about fifty years old yeah and then so she made out with him and then her friend did and then her two other friends that were with her so the, so I had to watch Kiefer open like, mouth open kiss, mouth kiss. Did for these other three women pay any money nope. Not the thing, like the one woman paid, so I don't know why I was like making out with these other. And my sister and I were so freaked opportunity? out. Maybe the answer is opportunity. Yes. Maybe Kiefer felt the first kiss was really only worth five hundred dollars, and, and, and since she paid the like, thousand, he felt he had to make it right. The second, third, and fourth woman, like yeah. at the, like the I don't know, it was just so bizarre, and he's just I don't know. And I had to stay. And my sister and I stood there and watched, like we're very Cooped uncomfortable. And they were open mouth kisses to the point where people it started moving their heads. That's how yeah. you know it's a serious kiss when the heads start moving. <laughs> but then you don't want that. That's bad. That's, oh God, why do we have to watch this? You know, that Jack Bauer has seen some real shit. Okay? <laughs> yeah, he has. And I'll, I'll bet he, he certainly works hard like a champion. I'll bet he kisses like a champion. <laughs> he doesn't hold anything back. That championship. I think season. the women lose that this, as you were saying. That's what, that, that's what that show is about, isn't it? Yeah. You the think the women lost. <laughs> You think the women had more to uh, That's what at you risk? Said. Mm. You might be right. <laughs> um, so yeah, the championship season was amazing. Uh, Jim Gaffigan's Broadway debut, amazing. If you have an opportunity to see this show, please rush. Uh, Jason Patrick was amazing. Whose father, Jason Miller, wrote the damn thing. Our own uh, Jason Antunes' uncle, I believe, directed the original cousin or uncle. Directed. Uh -huh. Call me your uncle, so he's like a neighbor. No, he's, we're cousins. <laughs> okay. I, I call him my uncle. Our own Jason Antunes' relative directed the original production, and um, Brian Cox and Chris Noth, and I don't think I left anybody else out. Keep yourself. Amazing production, great, phenomenal, incredible. And then, our last night in New York, we went to see Book of Mormon. You've probably heard a lot about it. I don't like people raising the expectations before I see something. They could not have been raised higher. And I direct this to Sammy, who hates musical theater. This was one of the greatest nights in terms of hilarity I've ever experienced. It was Blazing Saddles meets, what was the marionette movie they did? Team America. Team America. It was Blazing Saddles meets Team America live on stage with music, and it was fucking hilarious from start to finish. Oh, my God. It was like... Oh no! And then, like, 75 year old sitting next to us laughing uncontrollably at the most disgusting words ever. Sung with commitment. Oh God. It had a good message. And then a terrific message at the it end. It did. It really did. A fantastic the, message. The, Believe in yourself and you'll make a difference. And yeah, it's wonderful. Don't give away the message. It's Don't. like saying Bruce Willis is a ghost, man. Speaking of which, also this weekend, uh, yesterday. We went to the matinee of the uh, Scream 4. Spoiler alert. Do people get killed? There's a line in there. <laughs> Someone dies saying, fuck you, Bruce Willis. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so alert. fucking funny. It was, anyways. Uh, Book of Mormon. I hate to raise expectations because they are indeed a guarantee of disappointment. But, and I tweeted at intermission like, so far this is... Uh, simply the greatest thing in history. And it had that sense about it. It was like, I can't stop. This is weird and hilarious. Laughing. Um, the reason for this particular trip to New York was a personally uh, historical one, which I'll try not to go too into, although it's kind of hard to not. I talked about a little bit, I think, on the show prior. The 120th anniversary of Carnegie Hall was hosted by James Taylor. And he was talking with Steve Martin about three or four months ago and decided as part of the 120th anniversary he wanted to do some kind of tribute to Lenny Bruce because there was all kinds of tributes to music, Sting singing, Penny Lane, the tip of the hat to the Beatles, and so on. Bette Miller doing Sophie Tucker. Uh, so Steve Martin, who I just worked with on the big year coming out in October, said, I just worked with this guy, Kevin Pollock, he's a funny comedian, also does impersonations. He might be able to do Lenny. Cut to... I had my debut at Carnegie Hall uh, last Tuesday, and uh, basically Steve Martin, 
I think there's a shot we have of me and Steve on stage. Look at that. That's crazy. That's insane. That's one of those, you can take me now, Lord. I'm making that face and he's laughing. No, I was actually speaking. And um, we did a little patter between the two of us at the opening, uh, which was kind of funny at my expense, just to kind of be knighted by Steve before he um, left the stage and I did Lenny Bruce. And it was kind of cool because I wasn't trying to get laughs from Lenny's act, but rather uh, doing this little tribute piece. Lenny had a very famous midnight show at Carnegie Hall in 1963, which I found out was three weeks after the Kennedy assassination. And mm -hmm. there was this crazy snowstorm and everyone thought, no one's coming to this show. The whole country was pretty much it's still devastated at that point. The place was sold out, packed, it couldn't get a seat. And uh, he went on stage and started the show by saying, Von Meter is fucked. <laughs> Which, if you are in on that particular joke, Von Meter had the comedy album out at the time uh, called The First Family, I believe, about the Kennedys. Mm -hmm. And how about that as a way to break that ice? Um, but so anyways, this moment on stage for me, I'd never been ne nervous in my life, and I'd always spent my whole life kind of saying that. I don't get nervous, I don't get nervous. First Tonight Show with Carson, whatever it is. I always feel excited, like it's the first time at Disneyland. I don't, there's not a feeling of nerves like, oh, what if something happens? I just can't wait to get on stage. So, I'm getting to shower, I'm showering, getting ready for the show, Carnegie Hall debut. I'm in this show, it's amazing, it's crazy. And suddenly it hits me in the shower. Oh, fuck. I'm about to do a routine that I've never done before in front of an audience as my debut at Carnegie Hall. That, that, that's ridiculous. That's now the craziest thing I've ever done in my life to treat Carnegie Hall as an open mic night. I'm going to try out material. So obviously I'm, I've memorized somebody else's act from an album that was live where I could hear the audience reacting and I knew where the laugh moments were and they came and it was nice and it was fine and it was great. Still, never had this happening with my heart pounding, fighting my collar and tie, my heart was to get out. I'd never had that experience before, and it was bizarre. But I did walk out on stage to calm myself and say to an audience that was applauding, having just been introduced by Steve Martin, ladies and gentlemen, Kevin Pollack is going to do a little tribute to uh, Lenny Bruce. Kevin, and I walk out, and they're applauding, and I walked out and said, please be seated. And of course, no one was standing, so it was, right? And uh, it helped sort of calm me and center me a little bit. And then we did our thing, and it was, uh, it was fucking magical. Then, later in the show, former President Bill Clinton comes out. And he's talking about how important this night is and the money we're going to raise and so good that people are giving. Now, you're kind of cute. What's your name? And um, so I'm watching from the back of the room, and I said, I've got to rush backstage and get in the wings and position myself between him and the elevator so I can get that, hey, moment. Been a fan of his forever. So I rush backstage, I position myself, there's 17 security Secret Service dudes with the pens. How's it going? And I'm waiting, waiting, waiting. He comes off stage, he says something, 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 and then this moment happens. He makes a beeline right to me. Kevin, I've been a fan of yours for a long time. Can I just say that I was a fan of Lenny's too? He was here tonight. Thank you. I want you to know how special talent it took for you to get up there tonight. That's strange. A uh, feeling you have right now is, is me reaching inside of you and grabbing your heart. Why are you peeing into a water bottle is my only question. <laughs> That's a strange thing to do while I'm talking to you. I'll be honest. But I'm going to leave you now because I see you've got some business. What with the bottle? And then uh, I felt like, <laughs> do I call my mom now? Wait till I get back to the hotel? Yeah, it was really... Uh, one of the things that's always been said about uh, former President Clinton is that when he talks to you, he makes you feel like you're the only human being on the planet. And I'd always heard that. I am indeed a witness to that fact. It was ridiculous. Uh, a little bit of uh, feeling like you're levitating, and uh, wow, just wow. So thank, um, you know, the old adage, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. No, no. Not in my case. Someone else's material. Steve Martin, Steve Martin, <laughs> Steve Martin. That's how you get to Carnegie Hall. Uh, somebody else's material is also true. Um, so how about that? And there you go. Um, we have just uh, another little piece of uh, for something from the Ask Kevin. I think that's where we're at now. Oh, other than to thank 
Oh God, we we stayed at um, we're Jamie and I are foodies, and we're constantly talking about our love of all things regarding uh, the Food Network. We stayed at Bobby Flay and Stephanie March's home, and it was lovely and incredible. And I like then, to call her Smarch. Smarch. We stayed at Lousy Bobby and Smarch's smart place, weather. and then to really do the foodie thing, had dinner one night with Adam Richmond, star of Man vs. Food. So that was almost the highlight like, of the whole Food trip. Food Network versus Travel Channel. Yeah. Did they fight? <laughs> they did a throw. No, they actually, they, they're fans of one another. And then they ended up being. Oh, so man. Sad. I know. But uh, so thanks to all of those people, we had a, a pretty uh, historical trip. And now, here are your questions from Ask Kevin. And just another. Ask Kevin. Just, uh, thank you. Just another 32 minutes, we'll get to our guest. Um, if you want to ask any questions and have them possibly answered here on the show, write to contact at kevinpollockschatshow.com. That's contact at kevinpollockschatshow.com. Wow. This first one comes to you from uh, R underscore Sergeant. Dear Chat Show, I am interested to know about the industry term residuals. How exactly does this work? As an artist, are you paid a percentage for each time your performance is purchased slash broadcast? Or are you provided documentation accordingly? Does the compensation go up if the performance is aired in prime time or slash if it appears on the Lifetime Network at 3 a.m.? Are some simply paid a flat rate and then cut off from future payments? Thanks, Rick. Rick, I don't fucking know. <laughs> Jesus. Do I look like a SAG representative? What, what kind of a... Here's what Rick needs to know. Yes. Um, Sammy, a little help? Remember how uh, every so often you're reading the paper like, ooh, the actors are going to strike? Yeah. yeah. It's because of that bullshit. It's because of that bullshit. It's because of that bullshit where there are millions and millions and millions of dollars in revenue being generated from stuff being re-aired, replayed, resold, and the studios go, no, 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 we're going to keep all that. Yeah, we don't have any of that. We don't, we don't have any. We don't know what that, where that millions of dollars went. I mean, I can't believe that you're asking this question, Rick, first of all, in the 17-part question that it was. Cheers. Um, all this information is available online. Why are you fucking with the show here? I mean, seriously. Uh, all that information is online, Rick. And please. Well, I think he wants Google to know the shit out of it. Have you made fifty million dollars from all the airings of A Few Good Men? Uh, I will tell you this: a lot of people do think that we get a check based on every time something airs. <laughs> oh, that would if be sweet. If only that were the case. <laughs> My God, would I be just sitting in clothing made of cash? Um, but the truth is, these these shows are bought out in blocks, and they're, you know, I get residual checks from Few Good Men for about a dollar fifty. Um, that's how it ends up being. Um, so, there is your Ask Kevin. Was that it for the Ask Kevin? Just the one. Sweet. <laughs> Let's wrap it up. Dimitri's yawning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's not fair. He was sleeping actually. Um, he pulled a Kenny. <laughs> okay. Now the uh, little further. Uh, uh, version of the um, the fine Netflix ad. Uh, this chat show, as I mentioned, is being brought to you by Netflix. Um, and like I said, I, I'm kind of overly thrilled about this because I uh, we love having sponsors on the show, but I've, I've been after the idea of why shouldn't Netflix uh, sponsor us? And sure enough, Thanks to the, to the fine folks at PodTrack, as I mentioned, this is happening. So here we go. Netflix delivers movies to your home in about one business day. Plus, you can instantly stream thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to your PC or Mac or right to your TV through a Netflix-enabled device such as Xbox 360, PS3, or Nintendo Wii. All without late fees or due dates. One of the movies available to watch instantly this week on Netflix is Martin Scorsese's film Shutter Island starring Leonardo DiCaprio. If you love the idea of watching a great Twilight Zone episode in a long foreign film, this is the one for you, says I. Such a great brain teaser and beautifully executed by not only Scorsese and DiCaprio, but the cinematography by Bob Richardson is pretty amazing and stunning. Uh, like a myriad of rich, textured, riveting paintings from start to finish, and the visual effects by our dear friend Robert Legato, uh, past guest of the show, are pure magic. This is... Uh, a hugely recommended film, and you can watch it instantly from Netflix. Right the hell now. Along with countless other TV shows and specials, like the great stand-up comedy special, Dimitri Martin, comma, person. Now available instantly on Netflix. For a free trial and to 
Netflix instant streaming of thousands of movies, TV episodes, and more. Go to netflix.com forward slash Kevin. Again, this is a 30-day free trial. That's insane, by that the way. You can only get, that you can only get by going to this URL, netflix.com forward slash Kevin. Available to you thanks to Netflix and this show. That's insane. It's great, right? 30 days. These, I've seen like five days, seven days, 30 days. Whole month. You're going to forget that it was free. On us. And then it's going to end. You're going to go, I have to have this. And then what's Netflix? Like six bucks a month? Seven bucks a month? I think it's eight. Eight dollars a month. <laughs> That's the toll to get across the George Washington Bridge. That's a whole month of movies. There's a testimony we were hoping for. Come on! <laughs> Thank you, Sammy. Um, so there you go. Uh, I, it, it, you know, the idea of doing sponsorship for the show, I always hoped that they, some these sponsors would offer something to the viewers and not just... $5 off on your next purchase. 30 days free is pretty damn cool. So just to go to netflix.com forward slash Kevin. Uh, on us. Enjoy. Now, sorry, 27 minutes in the show. It's a new record, I think. After graduating from Yale as a law school student, my guest today was a superbly self-derailed failure. But it allowed him to answer his calling of becoming a stand-up comedian. Since making the choice, he has accomplished what others have only dreamed of. He was awarded the jury prize at the Aspen Comedy Film Festival. What if it just, not film festival, comedy festival. What if it just ended there? Those are the dreams of all comedians. He was awarded the jury prize at the Aspen Comedy Festival, and that's it. He also took top honors that would be the coveted Perrier Prize at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, which is astonishing, by the way, of accomplishments. A four-year writing stint on Late Night with Conan O'Brien, two years as a contributing writer and performer on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, a couple of fantastic stand-up comedy specials for the Comedy Central Network, and his own regular series on Comedy Central, Important Things with Dimitri Martin, as well as his first book, Coming to Stores Near You in a Matter of Days. I think you can pre-order the son of a bitch online right now. Uh, we'll talk about that and much, much more titled, This is a Book. Please welcome by Dimitri Martin. Thank you so hey, much for being here. And for sorry me. for the wait. Thanks. No, that was cool. <laughs> sorry for the half hour. Thanks for having me. I just realized as I was sitting here, I was like, I got dressed in my part in my bedroom uh -huh. where I have a white wall. Uh-oh. <laughs> no. Look how the light dances <laughs> off your shoulders. <laughs> you're, not a floating, separation. you're not a floating head. See, yeah. we got, now we have Levi. Or it's just a, an ethnic Greek head floating in your studio. That's right. And by the way, yeah. to answer the question, how long will it be before you look at the monitor? That no, was it. No time that was it. That was it. <laughs> but I got to watch you. There's a, a very slight delay, so it's kind of interesting. <laughs> it messes with your reality. How was that? That little delay. It was cool. It was most interesting when you, were, you went like this a couple times. So your, I could see both of your hands. Oh, uh, right. And one of them had the sound correctly <laughs> uh, going with it. Um, first of all, uh, I've often said on the show that we've had so many guests, and I've never dealt with a publicist, agent, or manager. And I want to give thanks to our mutual friend, Jason Antoon, yeah. for making this particular chat possible um, by getting in your face, I guess, a little bit, saying, do the show. No, Parker. that was cool. That yeah. was nice of him. And he's like, you know, if you ever want to do Kevin's show, I was like, yeah. So right. it worked out well. I appreciate it. Thanks. He's in the room. As it turns out, he's <laughs> actually in the room. We don't have a camera. Oh, wait, he's moved into Kenny's chair. <laughs> what is this? Dr. Chen, you're out? I'm not allowed to talk. Doesn't seem unfair. <laughs> the, the great beauty and torture for those of you watching uh, is that he's not allowed to talk. He's not mic'd. There's uh -oh. no camera on him. I think he's going to the chat room. And this is literally <laughs> the most torturous thing. He's now yelling at people in the chat room. But that was nice of him, so I'm yeah. appreciative as well. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm insanely appreciative, um, and let's, let's jump in, uh, if we may. I'm gonna, I like to go out of order. I like to uh, do the ridiculous. Let's start with the book. Okay, cool. Instead and of... I have something that, that might be surprising to you, okay. based on what you started with. All right. I was a White House intern in the summer of 96. I don't know if you guys have that in there. So we don't. So, in the Clinton White House, yes. I worked in domestic policy. It's when I was in law school. I did see that. Yeah. Domestic policy. Yes. Yes. So, domestic policy council. I was. I worked for the assistant deputy to the president on domestic policy as one of the interns. So, I had to apply. The guy who had that job had the same scholarship that I did. He went to the same law school that I went to. Right. He had that. So they said, if you apply, and you get the White House internship, you'll be assigned to him. I said, okay, cool. So I applied. So, what you were talking about reminded me of it because you were like, you're gonna make a beeline, try to meet Clinton. You got to shake his hand and stuff. So, we had this event. I was in the old executive office building. Our office was up there. We could see the sharpshooters on the roof of the White House. We were right across from that. So every day we come and sit in our little office, like eight interns in this room. 
and the guys in all black with rifles. Just to let people know, the sharpshooters are not actually trying to kill the president. <laughs> no. If they, if there's a, <laughs> there a disagreement, uh, yeah, if they go a little, you know, haywire some. But yeah, but so these guys are on the roof all the time, you know, in all black with rifles, binoculars. So if anybody rushes the White House, I guess they can kind of, you know, peg. You They're know, on edge for a 12 hour shift. So that's on the same floors where there's an event through our office. It was a teen pregnancy in initiative. Right. They were gonna help try to fight teen pregnancy. Our office organized it, so we got to go to the event. When I say we, I mean me and another intern from my law school. In the same scholarship program that I was in, we both got the internship. Crazy. This girl. So our boss comes and says, here's the deal. Here's the room, it's at the end of these two halls. And then there's the side, this side is where the elevator is and the Congress people are gonna come, some people from the public they invited, they're gonna all come in the room here and go fill the auditorium. This hallway is where the president's gonna come in with my boss and some other you know, people around him and stuff. And they said, okay, Dimitri, you're gonna be at this door. So luck of the draw, I'm at the door where Clinton comes in now. The president's gonna come right by me with everything. Sure. This other girl. Poor thing. She's, she's, at the, she's at the public side. Now, there's a secret hallway. Better believe it. The two hallways, yeah, so you can get from one hallway to the other behind this auditorium, basically. this very, like, narrow corridor. So the event starts, and uh, our instructions were just wait till the president comes. Stand outside, he'll come, and then go, you can go inside during the event, listen to his presentation or whatever. When it's done, just go back outside. So sure. Now, you know, you've been in showbiz a long time, and so people in showbiz, there is that kind of, there can be a shitty kind of go-gettery, shine for other people, show off kind of thing. Politics has it too, but in a, in a kind of, for me, grosser, kind of weirder way. Do you know what I mean? Of like kind of, I don't know what the word is, but it's like trying to like beat the system. Right. Like, anyway, I just put that in there because I felt like I got a big taste, a big taste of it when this happened. So, all right, president comes in, the event starts. Now I'm standing by my, inside my door, watching the whole thing. Cool, this is interesting. Wow, he just walked by, he's doing a speech, and uh, all of a sudden she appears next to me. So she's supposed to be on the other side. Right. But now the event's happening and now she's standing next to me on my side. Right. What do you, I'm thinking, what is she doing over here? She's supposed to be at the other side, all right, whatever. Did you, you didn't ask her? No, because we were just watching the thing. I didn't want to talk or anything. Sure. So a Secret Service guy is standing both next to both of us. And this guy's got like. He's crazy. Muscles, crew cut, the wire coming out of his ear, you he, know. He can kill you in 14 seconds. He looks like he'll kill you. He, he could, looks like he might kill you by mistake. Sure. He's like shaking your hand and just kills you. Like, what? What? <laughs> so, so, by the way, please put this down somewhere. I would like to actually be killed by mistake. <laughs> then you get to heaven. The guy's awesome. Like, oh, dude, I'm so the, sorry. They're like, we are so sorry. <laughs> yeah, just the guy was completely fucked up. He doesn't usually drink coffee. <laughs> you should not have been there. What were you doing? I thought you had to pee. Were you supposed to be peeing? This guy killed you. Anyway, it's going to be a better heaven for you, so don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. There's levels? Yes, you yeah, get absolutely. better. You get a better one. Yeah. Accidents are like near the top. Did you not see heaven can wait? This is how it works. <laughs> Accidents and nuns. It's yeah. better depending on whose opinion. You know. So anyway, I'm standing next to this guy. So the thing ends, and the president's wrapping up. This big Secret Service guy turns to us, and he goes, make sure nobody leaves until I come get you, until I come tell you. As in, make sure nobody leaves the event. I'm thinking, we're both, I'm thinking, what? <laughs> so then. You hear the last line of defense? <laughs> so yeah. It's just like kind of weird, you know? So she doesn't move. Like she doesn't go back to her side. Her post. Her post. We were assigned. She's like playing chicken with me. She won't, she won't go over there. So I, that's when I say, so are you gonna go back to your, you know, you're gonna go to the other side? She's like, you can if you want. Because she so, wants the moment with Clinton? So, yeah, I guess. I'm not even thinking that. I'm not even, that's, I'm not that strategic. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, I'm thinking, what? So, I, I run. I run, I leave the room and I go through that secret hallway and I run to the other side. And there's, this is big. The old executive office building has these big hallways, really high ceilings and it's really wide. And I get over there and people are coming out of the room on the public side. So, I stand and I'm just blocking everybody in this big <laughs> hallway and I have like my little badge. Sure. My little intern thing, I got a short sleeve shirt with a tie. Oh, God. Totally perfect, beat upable casting, like total, you know. So I'm standing there. People are coming out, and I'm like, everyone, please, um, you just have to wait. We just have to hold for, you know, a few minutes here, if you can just please wait. 
And then this woman tries to walk past me. It's like older woman. And I, I'm like, ma'am, please, you have to stop. And then this guy pops up from behind her and it's like, uh, this is Senator Boxer or somebody like, it was like, this is Senator so-and-so. It's like her aide. So I'm like, I'm sorry, please. Of course, Senator. Now a congresswoman comes, a congressman. So I'm, who do I let go? Who do I not? And I remember everybody, I saw everybody started overtaking me. <laughs> and I remember turning and going like this and saying, no, wait, please stop. <laughs> and then I saw like the press, some press people scurry along the wall, almost like rats or something. And they had those, those vests, like exactly like you think, you know, like in right. Continental Divide. What's the movie? I don't know what I'm thinking of, the Belushi movie where he plays Continental that. Divide. Yeah, there. Yeah. That's a reference. Very, very current. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to those, those catching vests think? with the pockets, you definitely go to Continental And when you Divide. think of Belushi, you think of Continental, <laughs> Continental Divide. Divide. Yeah, I'm a comedy guy, I know. So I see the press like in the little row. They run by. And I think, oh boy, this is not good. <laughs> Secret Service guy comes out. Comes out of that hallway. He looks at me and goes, what the fuck? Yeah, what the fuck? What the hell's going on? And I was like, I tried, I was trying to hold everybody, but a uh, senator came by and then I didn't know who I could let go or whatever. And he goes, no, you can't do that. Now we have a problem. Turns. Breach, breach. <laughs> swear to God, turns and runs back down the hall, disappears. I left there. I'm like, I'm going to throw myself out the window. I'm like, what did I do? Why did you guys ask me? What did I do? Hung for treason. I got in trouble. I did get, not big trouble, but I got in trouble. And they explained to me later, they want the president to get out of the, get out of there before people leave because the press can catch him in the hallway, turn their lights on, now all of a sudden it can be a sound bite. You know what I mean? Yeah, but to give that assignment to an I intern, know. stop senators from getting past you. But you know what? This is what pissed me off. We go back to, to law school in the fall, and everybody who had the scholarship, there were about 15 of us who had the scholarship, and uh, there was a booklet of what everybody did over the summer. This person worked for uh, labor rights, this sure. person, whatever. And on the cover of it was a picture of my fellow intern, the girl, shaking Clinton's hand. She, no. she got her photo right where I was supposed to be standing. While I was going, oh, wait, please stop. She was like, <laughs> that's why she said you can go over there if you want. You believe that? She totally snaked she, you. She wanted, she was, she, I, she, I guess she knew she wanted to, because if you were an intern in the White House, they had a, they have a, you know, White House photographer. They have yeah. staff photographers and they take pictures every day. And if you're in one, they'll say, hey, we have a picture of you with the president. You know, if you want to come, we'll wrap it up for you. You know, you can go get it. And then you get to have one of those. I wonder if her story of meeting the president is in her new book. Thank you. There you go. She That's doesn't have a book. That's what I'm talking about, Sam. <laughs> she doesn't have a book. As far as Where's I know, she doesn't have a book or several. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or a career. That's right. <laughs> Look at me. Look at you. I can yeah. get on in any open mic in Los Angeles. That's right. <laughs> Slotted. Yeah, no son, questions asked. You son of a bitch. <laughs> No questions asked. Very few questions asked. <laughs> How much time are you going to do? And yeah. Can you come back next week? Can the senator get by? Does it have to be tonight? <laughs> Were you the guy who messed up the uh, White House thing? Yeah, that's me. How much time do you want to do? Five minutes. <laughs> anyway, I thought it seemed pertinent. The story's yeah, not yes, usually really relevant for beautiful. anything. But oh, man. It's funny, but I, I did get to meet him once, and I, I concur with what you said. I met him twice over the years, you know. Parties, hanging out, open mics. Sure. <laughs> no, I did some. I did a stand up at the Clinton Global Initiative once in New Orleans. This is one of his foundations. So I got to shake his hand. Captivating guy. And uh, did he take your hand in both when he shook your hand? Yeah. Right. He gave me that second. Yeah. That. Mm -hmm. Held it for uh, uncomfortably long. That's right. <laughs> um, and then um, never blinked or took his eyes off yours. That right. was the other incredible talent I thought right. he had. Yes. And a, and a certain kind of. Um, <laughs> There's a certain ease. I think there's a, it's kind of a, a really kind of expert eye contact, maybe. Some people, they'll, do, they'll look at you the whole time. And, you know, in life, we've all met these people. But it's, yeah. it's a little scarier. I feel like it's yeah. like a Dale Carnegie. All my references are from, like, the 50s and 60s. <laughs> <laughs> I probably Carnegie. mentioned Carnegie Hall, and that's why it's lost in your mind. <laughs> to oh quote, God. you know, I, I, I Walter Winchell, I believe, said uh, when shaking somebody's hand, I'm talking about here. How to influence friends? Yeah. Anyway, sometimes people, I feel like they're giving you a power handshake, like, "Hey, man, hey, brother," you know, that kind of a thing. But of course, Clinton's not like that. No, he's like, "Hey, man, I could look at your eye. You know, I can keep eye contact all day. It's, I am I'm losing fine with myself it. in your eyes. That's you right. are the most fascinating right. person I've ever talked to. And by the way, that weird taste in your mouth is my penis. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah, check, please. <laughs> uh, 
So let, let us go ahead and talk about the book a little bit since that intern has no book out. Yeah. Um, I do love, was it the first special that was called Demetri Martin Person? Yes, first and only. Oh, I, have, I, I did a Comedy Central Presents Hello. before that, so that's my first, but that's, a, that's more of a cookie And then cutter. this is a book, and then this is a drawing of yours on the cover, I'm assuming? Yeah, right? colored pencils. Right. Look at that. It took a while. I should figure out that drawing for me. There we go. Uh, people can go to Amazon, I believe, and pre-order the son of a bitch. Yes, yeah. and I think Amazon... 30-day um, free? They Yes, you get a 30-day <laughs> free... You can browse Amazon for free for 30 days if you uh, get the book. I just put slash Dimitri bullshit, I think dot bullshit or something. The, uh, they, they got them in stock early, so it's, it's officially out April 25th, but now Amazon has them already, so they, you can get it regular Amazon. It's not a pre-order anymore. It's and this is order. your first book? Yeah. Um, how long was the process for you to do that? Yeah. This was when I had the show... And you've been around a while, so you know how the heat, you get a little heat, and then you got stuff going on, you get casting stuff. And well, you got that people, heat, you got agents and, it, and people saying, you really should do this, you really should right. do that. Right, and then it, and it wanes, it mm. goes kind of up and down. So a couple of years ago, I had the Comedy Central show, and I had some heat, and they said, if you ever want to write a book, you know, this might be a good time to, excuse me, you know, see if we can, you can get a book deal. Sure. So I went, and uh, I got a book deal. But then I was doing the show, so it took a while to, for me to deliver. Right. They were cool, and they were really patient. I couldn't do it when I was doing the show. Uh, so that was, I think, 2009. So last spring, the show's canceled. Um, I've got time now. And my, my literary agent says, hey, uh, so listen. Now while well, the heat's gone. Things are cooling off. Your heat's gone. And uh, he didn't say that, but yeah. <laughs> his tone said that. <laughs> his tone, like, oh, Dimitri, right. And by his tone, do you mean his assistant? Yeah, <laughs> his assistant just tone his, assist his assistant's could... <laughs> voicemail, I think, had that tone. So no. So my my agent said, "Hey, listen. So you got to hand in the book by September, or they're going to restructure your deal, uh, which means you know, based you're on gonna, your heat, you're going to have to give the money back. <laughs> so you now you will have no heat or money to pay for for heat. For so, heat. So uh, I said, I understand. So I wrote the book all last summer to get it in in time in September, and then I got to fiddle with it a little bit in September. So mostly I just wrote it over the summer. <laughs> And then what? We know what you did last <laughs> summer. That sounds, I know it's, it's probably not what you meant, but this sounds like my report was due, they gave us a month's notice. Uh, yeah, I really was slagging bit. off on the job, so I just did it the weekend before it was due. You know, I'm like most people, I just, I need those deadlines. I can't, I can't get the stuff done without, without them. So once they kind of scared me, I said, okay, here we go. I had to uh, memorize the Lenny Bruce thing for Carnegie Hall and really started focusing on it and studying it and memorizing it about a week before. Wow. Knew about it for months. Wow. And I thought, I don't want to be over-prepared. <laughs> <laughs> Which is such right. horseshit. Right. Carnegie well, Hall, first time, why over-prepare? Right, right, right. Why right. would you want well, to? Well, that is funny when you said, you know, you're doing material you've never done before. I mean, as a comic, I, I hear that. That's, that's, crazy. A cra that's a crazy, yeah. I think it's, it's kind of a crazy the craziest move. thing ever. For comics, that's that's a weird thing to do. But that's, a, talk, that's a kamikaze mission. Right. But I talked to uh, Steve Martin about it when it, when I realized it, and I was backstage and telling him, "Jesus, this just happened," and he said, "Where would you have really tried it out, though? You can't, you can't, in essence, <laughs> that's go." Steve Martin. <laughs> yeah, that's Steve Martin saying. <laughs> that guy is he has embraced technology. It's really amazing. <laughs> that's Steve Martin saying. I never said that. You fucked. <laughs> this guy is on Twitter, man. <laughs> but it's nice to know he's watching. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, it, uh, it was actually your agent saying, hey, we did get that money. <laughs> Dimitri, um, he's like, I know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> now I remember. Uh, but he said, where would you really have, what audience would you have done that in front of? There right. is no audience. Because right. you couldn't go at a club and say, I just want to try out this thing I'm right. doing at the... Right. And then there's no a, context. Right. Plus, that, you can't really go to a club and be like, I want to do another comics material. From 1963, <laughs> yeah. which will you know, be dated as dated can be. That's interesting. Um, so in, how, and how is Carnegie Hall? I've heard the room's not as big as people expect. True. Acoustics are weird. I've heard from music. I don't Awful. know if that's true. Yeah. Interesting. Um, people? But monitors, great. Nice. So then the acoustics were sort of overpowered by great monitors, and that's always nice. Uh, that's such a cool photo to have with Steve Martin, <sighs> him laughing. I, I mean, it'd almost be better to have a photo with, the, with him having a, a face of disapproval. <laughs> <laughs> of just like, what did you say? He was yeah. like, I think I farted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm just like, oh. Almost. But that's awesome. I mean, that's like, No, I, <laughs> I wish I had both But now. if it was like, just kind of confusion, yeah, like, 
Oh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just theme like, doing this. I don't know. Like, not my fault, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's drawings and there's musings, and then what else is in the book? Yes, yeah, so the book is kind of... Thank you, by the way. Thank Please. you for having me on and for, and thank you for promoting the book. This. And Sign, thank you for signing this copy to me. Absolutely. I, I use a very light ink, so <laughs> subtlety is my, my trade. Uh-huh. This... Um, the book is like a, it's like a grab bag. So there's some short stories, lists, yeah, drawings. Once you got past like the task portion of, oh, I've got this deadline, my paper's due, it must have been a little fun at times. Oh, I had a great time. Right. I'm, I'm writing another book now. I don't have a deal yet, but I'm, I'm writing a book. Probably best to write it first. <laughs> yeah, this time. And I'm, then be ready when the heat comes. That's right. And hey! I can just hand that over for right. my heat. Write a bunch. Yeah, it, it was actually, I had a lot of fun. It's interesting, as, as a comic, uh, you probably would agree. We have the luxury of having an audience guide us and tell us, yeah, that bit's good. Keep that. Get rid of that. You don't need that tag. You know, I feel like... Especially it's only as, in time you find your own voice and you start to rely on your own instincts. Yeah. But even then, you need them to validate I think so. your instincts. For me, it's yeah. like, yeah, it's, I like that about it. It's always surprising and challenging and very humbling. And I always feel like um, I think I figured it out or... I show up with the pile of jokes, and they go, oh, yeah, cool, these are great. Right. And, uh, and I'm wrong, you know. Mm-hmm. A couple of them are. One that I didn't think would work somehow it seems to keep working, so I'm like, okay, the audience taught me. I get it. With a book, of course, I don't have that luxury. It's more of a vacuum. Yeah. So it's just me in my apartment trying to figure it out. So now I get to find out after all that work. Is there anyone in your life at this point that you might bounce something off? Yes, Steve Martin, although I don't know him. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't tried. No, my girlfriend, she's... She's been very tolerable. Uh, no. <laughs> Tolerant. <laughs> She's tolerable from your perspective. <laughs> She's been both tolerant and tolerable. She's taller well, and a, a bunch of take. stuff after that. Yeah. She's taller take. with the suffix. Yeah. <laughs> She's, uh, She's been very patient and a, a patient. Uh-huh. <laughs> Um, but even there, like, you know, I, what, I don't like trying my stuff out on people. The worst. Like, you know, they don't, I just, that's what an audience is for. Yeah. And if you're mad at them, then you try out in the In fact, we had stuff a rehearsal, <laughs> and they said, do you want to run the bit? They wanted yeah. me to run the bit oh, for, like, right? 19 technicians sitting oh, in the wow. audience. And I said, that's not the memory I want in my head no. before I go on tonight. That's a way to totally fuck with your, with yeah. your performance in your head. Because, yeah, you putting, those guys get all this importance. Yeah. They can play a practical joke, and you'd be like, hey, you know what would be funny? Right. Let's not laugh at anything. Let's be totally silent while he runs this. But also, you, you point out something quite valid, which is you're not going to really know anyways until you do it for the entire audience in, yeah. in the moment. So. Right. And, you know, good for you. You've, you've, you run Carson and stuff. I mean, you've been through so much stuff. You go into Carnegie Hall. Granted, it's Carnegie Hall, but you figure you'll be able to adjust. Unlike most of our performances, you're doing somebody else's. It's something scripted. You're doing a... Performance. Per- perform- performance. Yeah. You're performing a piece, but still, you can fiddle with the timing. You can speed up. You can slow down if you have to. I you know. changed one word, and uh, it actually ended up getting one of the bigger laughs. Is that right? Because uh, he used the word rabbi, and I changed it to moil, because it had to do with oh, the orthodox uh, philosophy that he talks about having a tattoo and how the Steve Allen show wouldn't let him do this bit about this tattoo. Oh, because you, ca- you, can't, you can't go to the Jewish gr- cemetery, because right. the the... Orthodox philosophy is no marks. You have to go out of the world the way you came in, no marks, no changes. And then he said, which certainly belied the whole rabbi uh, philosophy. I don't know how that swings. And unless he was doing this motion, because right. he was talking about circumcision, right. it didn't make any sense sure. to use the word rabbi. So I just changed it to moil. And Good luck when you die, man. He's going to be there. Oh, he's going to be waiting. What up? What's yeah. happening, man? A, it didn't sound like <laughs> me. At all. <laughs> I've never moved like that. God, I'm really on death today, huh? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's my wearing black on the black. I'm just, I look like a um, cousin of the angel of death. Speaking of that, and your upbringing, which I insist. <laughs> yes. Um, I, you, you've said in some of the interviews in terms of having a, uh, a Greek Orthodox priest as a father mm-hmm. that um, he uh, was a, a great public speaker, of course, but also there was a sense of, um, or I'm sort of taking this from all yeah. of it, that there was sort of a relaxed nature to it as opposed to yeah. what I would envision as just using the word orthodox. Yeah, right, orthodox strict sounds strict hardcore. About everything. Yeah, my dad, I feel really lucky in that way. He was, uh, he was from Brooklyn, so my, both of my parents' parents 
are from Greece, mm -hmm. but they're from your parents, my parents are, are first from generation Americans. yeah from Brooklyn, and my father. Uh, he became a priest. He became a Greek priest. So, in the in the Greek religion, the Greek Orthodox thing, you it's weird. You can get married before you become a priest, you and you get kid. to keep your wife. <laughs> you you don't have to you, trade her in, right? But if you are single and you take the vows to be a priest, then you can't get married after that. No kids. You yeah. can't do anything. Yeah, that's it. You You're have done. to be celibate. So it's just like weird. That's a nice toll little, booth or something you go through. It's a nice little uh, <laughs> it's just like, loophole. It's a weird loophole. It's like not not particularly In fact, logical. But. Knowing that loophole, yeah. Dare I put this out there for a a Greek Orthodox priest swinger to, uh, uh, who's possibly choosing that as a right life choice and profession? Maybe uh, make sure you get married and have kids before. Figure that out. Yeah. Now, what if you, you're married? Sammy, you went does, to the priesthood. Does this question involve time travel? Because nope. I don't have an answer. Okay. Nope. <laughs> You're in the priesthood, and it doesn't work out with the lady. Right. You allowed to get remarried, or is that that? I think, number one, you go to hell. It's like an express train to hell, from what oh, I understand from man. the scripture. I'm just kidding. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. No, I don't think you are. I think you're not allowed to. I think you, you then have to be celibate. So I will say, and um, I think your research is pretty accurate. My father, from what I've said before, it's true. I, I don't know anything about the Bible. Like, we weren't raised uh, very uh, heavy-handedly or doc doctrinally, I guess would be the word. He was a really good public speaker, and he was like a community leader. Right. The thing with the, the Greeks, where I grew up, was um, all the Greek people in New Jersey, where I'm from, are all Greek Orthodox. There's like one church in that area. So really, it's the religion and the ethnicity are kind of fused. It's a, you know what I mean? It's like an immigrant community. Whereas, social. Yeah, it's social. Like, uh, my Catholic friends, they had choices. They could go to this church or that church, or there were subdivisions. But it was like, if you're Greek, that's the church you go to. That's where all the Greek people go on Sunday. So it was kind of like that. And the service was mostly in archaic Greek. He was like singing and chanting this stuff. I, I don't know what he was saying. It was Sometimes I would look in the book. They'd have a book as a translation. And in Greek, it sounds so holy and kind of mystical. And there's incense. And, you know, he had like this weird cape on and stuff. You're like, wow, this is definitely not the was usual more cape, stuff. More cape than robe? Probably I like, more robe. I like I, the I, idea of cape. My mom used to say I called it a cape. I was like, did he? Be, I said, did Dad become a priest because he wanted to fight crime? Want to wear a cape? You know, it's kind of a superhero thing. But uh, the chanting sounds so mystical and stuff. But when you read a translation of it, it was just like, God, you know, you're the best. Please, you know, we really love you. You're really, you yeah, are the guy. If there's anything you, know? you need. Yeah, we again, you know, we we love you, God, and you are the best. You know, it's like all that kind of. It's like, wow, they're really. Kissing Sounds up a lot to this. like uh, Judaism. <laughs> is that right? It's like really kissing up to God here, I think. <laughs> Trying to get something? Yep. Yeah. We get into heaven or whatever, so. Avoiding smote. But the cool thing was he was, he was a really good public speaker. His, his sermons were really um, just, he'd have the back of an envelope and just a couple things jotted down, and then he would do like 20 minutes. And it was anecdotal and personal. I think he just had a good talent for speaking extemporaneously, basically. That had he had jokes. Like he knew how to structure jokes mm -hmm. and do bits. Now, in retrospect, I can understand them as bits. But at the time, you know, I just thought, oh, he's funny. You know, was what was that point when you realized it was um, dad? It went from dad's really uh, kind of cool and comfortable up there to my God, he's improvising every week. Yeah, this is way after because because yeah. um, that's not something we we have. Yeah. And as a kid, any perspective. Right. I don't think as a kid, I, I remember think, I remember seeing, this is funny, I tell my friends this sometimes, uh, I remember one time watching TV when I was a kid, and I'd watch Family Ties, and I think the way it was where I grew up, Cheers would come on after Family Ties. Mm -hmm. And I remember noticing once, Cheers started, and they had the credits, and it said, so-and-so, so-and-so, written by. And you know, you remember certain things from when you were a kid, yeah. your logic as a child, your child mind. I remember that moment for some reason, seeing the words written by, and thinking, written by? <laughs> <laughs> They're writing this? What's written? It's, they just got funny people who hang out in a bar, and they film them, and <laughs> what? What, what are they writing? It's just Who's it's writing? Ridiculous, yeah. come on. But it's so funny that that's the world. I just think that Cheers is basically a documentary about funny people. <laughs> like, like, how talented would those actors be? It's like amazing. And everybody, the camera work, be like, they just knew he was going to say something funny. Uh -huh. So yeah, I think you're right. Like, when you're a kid, your reality is different. You don't 
I don't think it was my father as somebody who was good at improvising. I also like that your perspective still is that Cheers may have only followed family ties in your area. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. It's, it was syndicated. It's a local, <laughs> just a local little. In the rest show. of the country, I think they had Cheers. Uh, <laughs> it was on after T.J. Hooker. Much so. later. Um, My references are now in the 80s, so I'm, <laughs> by the end of our conversation, I'll be in the present. If we go too long, I'll be in the future. <laughs> well, that's what I'm going for. I now have my uh, incentive and goal. Um, Jersey Shore or, or Jersey proper? I'm from the town next door to Jersey Shore, and we had a Greek food stand at the boardwalk. I'm from Tom's River, so it's next to Seaside Heights where that show takes place. So, so p pretty much Jersey Shore. And you watched... Uh, the area changed, but I'm imagining even in your youth, there is a um, 80s version of what we're what yes. some of us are now mesmerized by. Sadly, yes, and it's it's pretty much the same thing. I'd like to but think there's been no evolution. Around. Very little. It's just that the guys wax their chests now. I'm sorry. The guys now looks like they wax their chests, mm -hmm. right? Don't they? Isn't that part of the thing? More the, tattoos and. Yeah. I haven't seen. I've seen about three minutes of the show. But yeah, does anybody? I have not seen it. Your viewers are probably big fans, so we'll probably get a lot of. Oh, I think we, big fans. We are big fans here, actually. Of Jersey Shore. I can't take my eyes off it. Yeah, it's. I can. I can promise you, there's some chest waxing going on. <laughs> Wouldn't you concur? I think Ronnie even waxes his underarm hair. But those guys all have. Like, yeah. the, don't they? When they get in jacuzzis and stuff, they don't have hair on their no. chest, right? No. They yeah. wax. I so think Ronnie you, waxes everything. You know, for the Xenodrin. So commercial. that's going to be either alopecia, some weird accident, or like waxing. I don't it's think waxing. It's, it's waxing. Yeah, it's waxing. So. Um, that's the only difference. I, when I was there, but it's, it's a thankfully in your youth, there was plenty of hair to go around. Plenty of hair, and I'm Greek, so there was even hello bonus. We had extra and bonus hair. I was in a Greek dancing group once <laughs> for a while. I was in a in a in a. In that a, was the other thing I noticed that yeah. you and Antoon had hugely in common, which was the skateboarding and the break dancing. That's right. I love break. Yeah, that was my first passion. Get That's you it. guys a piece of cardboard, and you're off to the races. This sounds like a, an interview with a guy, how to not get laid. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let me see. So uh, the breakdancing, the skateboarding. <laughs> we haven't even got to the palindrome. We haven't got to the palindrome yet. <laughs> Show stopper. <laughs> Career stopper. <laughs> Show under. No, yeah. Um, but uh, that was, it's funny. I think what I am drawn to in comedy in many ways is a little bit outsidery. And I think it's because where I'm from, I wasn't good at sports. And if you weren't good at sports, you're nothing. I was kind of marginalized. I think everybody probably felt like a dork in high school and stuff, but I was truly. I mean, I was on the math team. I, and, and if I was from another place, I'd be a dork, I think, for being on the math team, but it not maybe, it wasn't, wouldn't be as egregious right. a transgression to be like that. You know what I mean? But where I'm from, it's a lot of kind of tough guy culture. Maybe it's changed, but I don't think so. It, it's, I haven't been around in a while over there, but right. that's what it was. It was sports, football. Where are you from? San Francisco? Same thing. <laughs> well. It's <laughs> <laughs> the, the guy who knows nothing about geography. Exactly. <laughs> San Francisco. No, but see, okay, so you had, you had more culture. You had access to well, I mean, more I was, and I, different culture. I was raised in a suburb out of the city, and um, I think the sense has always been um, sports uh, and the cheerleading squad, those are the popular people, and then yeah. the rest of us find a way, and, and the people who did drama were drama freaks. Right. And uh, it's all about clicks and where you fit in. Yeah. Um, and it's pretty easy to feel alienated no matter what. And then you yeah. stack things against yourself with yeah. these various. You make a couple of mistakes. You make a couple of choices. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> and then you're, right. that's kind of your, your outfit and then that people can judge you. And the rape your sophomore year. Yeah. And then that doesn't help. Math rape. I mean, it was. <laughs> it was. Oh, no, I should be clear. <laughs> there was no human rape going on. Yeah, it was. It was <laughs> right. Uh, Algebra, right? Polynomials. <laughs> disgusting ones. Um, what age are you when you see Stephen Wright for the first time? I think I'm in... <laughs> there was... <laughs> was that... Was it? that was my glass. That was his glass. Sam's glass made a fart sound, but it was uh, one of those perfect who, mimics of... Who a, hasn't made a fart sound with their glass? And this one always has gas, so I just assumed. Yeah. <laughs> he is professionally gas. proudly take credit. I like referring to him as this one. <laughs> oh. yeah. There's never anything... Well, maybe nope. people refer to good it. things with this one. This one's a genius. <laughs> <laughs> That's one. always facetious. This one. No one says sincerely, right. this one's a genius. Right. No, um, uh, I, saw, I think I saw Stephen Ray for the first time. I, I was still in New Jersey. I think it was in high school. And so I'm, I'm a child of the 80s in that I, I got to see my introduction to stand-up was really on television. Sure. Uh, not even late night, probably 
for you, no, Carson, like Carson was around, but you were evening at the Improv. You yeah. had all. You had five. In fact, stand up spotlight on VH1 became a big it. thing. Fantastic. MTV half hour comedy hour. All those things popped up, that, that glut of stand-up on television in the 80s. Which is ultimately what killed the gold rush of stand-up yeah. comedy, the same way uh, that it killed vaudeville, which was an inventory problem. Too much yeah. inventory, not enough quality. Right, and, and also, I guess, even the way the inventory was understood mm -hmm. became compartmentalized, right? In these four or five minute chunks, had to be clean. Right. Um, and even the relegation of, or what became alternative comedy, it seems like alternative comedy is, is often comedy that's harder to produce. Like, look, yeah. we have a mic and a brick wall. Like, can you? Yeah. Don't not the accordion. You know, whatever. Like, it's <laughs> it's harder to do certain things right. uh, for production. I think even you know, it's like a pain in the ass. Yeah. Well, you were kind of um, where did where where was your timing in the so-called alternative comedy scene? Were you did you sort of when you finally started? Um, in the middle of it, the beginning of it? I think, let's see. Based I on your age, I think you're somewhere in the middle I of the beginning. I think I'm in the middle. I started in uh, the summer of 97. When I started, uh, Luna Lounge was, was a big room in New York for, I guess, what is now called alternative comedy. Right. Um, I think it was at a place called Rebar before that. And I, 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 that was before my time, so I, hadn't, I didn't see that kind of a show there yet. But at that time, there, were no, there was no microphone. There were just couches. It was in the back room of this bar. And, on the Lower East Side, which was obviously very different than a comedy club. So that was considered, for my generation in New York, that was like kind of the alternative room for a while. Right. There were other ones, and some of them were open mics and coffee shops and those kinds of places. Would you go and watch other acts first? I only, I think I saw stand-up three times before I tried it, live. I only saw it three times. And I dropped out of school before I tried it. Right. But so I, yeah. So you were kind of when you saw Stephen Wright on TV in one of these shows, doing his five minutes. Yeah. What I what I thought was, um, like, oh, that's that's that feels more like. That's what I think is funny. I don't know. It's different. I think a lot of times when I see stand ups, I bet you a lot of people have this experience, and I don't know if you did, but you could almost predict punchlines, sure. and you, I, I wouldn't be laughing so much as I'd be kind of, oh yeah. Right. right. Well, that's interesting. But then a few people would really, I'd feel surprised. Right. And I couldn't really predict what, where it was going. That's an interesting barometer, because that, that, that's ultimately what it comes down to, I think, for people, whether they realize it or not. Can yeah. you surprise me? I think so. I think anything that I've laughed at in my life, most of them I would have been surprised, like, shortly before laughing. Like, right. pretty close to the laugh. Yeah. Like, some, some sort of a surprise. And it's... Of course, it's a weird sliding scale that's going to change through your life mm -hmm. based on how much you've been exposed to. It's funny how hack bits are hack because they've been done so many times, but if you came from another planet and you didn't know any of those references, or, you know, the first time you see it, right. it's a well-written, you know, it can be well-structured and sound and like, well, yeah, it's really funny. Of course, I get it. Yeah. But if the topic is... It's just been done. It's just tired. not surprising. Yeah, yeah, it's tired, you know, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, so there was a surprise element, I think, there for me. I think so. Uh, without question that the surprise element that you've sort of um, crystallized, one of the things that not only touches an audience, but a performer, too, in terms of relating to, oh, right, wow. I always say that the, the highest compliment for, for a comic about another comic's work, for me at least, is I wish I'd thought of that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? There's Absolutely. Like, there's like, I feel like the lowest is, Wow, that's unfunny. That's not funny. Above that, maybe is that's not funny to me, but I think I understand how that's funny to other people. Right. And then above that is that's funny. Then above that is actually laughing. Uh -huh. And then above that is a little bit of like, oh, that's so so right there. That's so good. I can't I, believe I didn't. Think, I know. Yeah. I wish you know. And you you admire. And, and in the next level, by the way, is wishing death on that person. That's right. That's right. <laughs> then the bitterness. After that, and then just about, then death on yourself, which is like, wait a minute, I'm just depressed. <laughs> and then now. This has nothing. <laughs> and then laughing. Again. And then it gets funny again. <laughs> we like to involve the audience, great, with their live tweeting questions that Jamie is sending uh, here and there. Um, it looks like this first one is a tweet five, tweet Jamal, five. and tweet so David five. Keckner tweet five reminds us that we have a thing called tweet five. Uh, these are this or that Coke or Pepsi type questions that Great. an audience member has structured specifically for you. Great. Or so we've asked. Let's see if it actually holds true. No correct answer. 
Rapid Fire, New York or New Jersey? New York. Stand up or improv? Stand up. Transformers or GoBots? Neither. F f neither is correct. <laughs> Fruits or vegetables? Fruits. Scrabble or Boggle? Scrabble. Uh huh. Wow, that was cool. That was cool. <laughs> that was pretty good. <laughs> How can you turn your back on New Jersey like that, sir? <laughs> That was, that was easy for me. <laughs> I love New Jersey, I'm from there. But I lived in New York more recently. I lived in New York for 13 years. And my, my comedy upbringing is in New York. And a lot of the shows that I saw and liked and... Found yourself as an artist, all these things. I think so, you know, I remember just a random thing, going to see a Chuck, Chuck Close, a Chuck Close show. There's paintings. It was in New York, it was in New Jersey. Right. And that's the kind of thing that I was, I was grateful to be in New York for, was stuff like that. You know, Chuck Close, like, they're, they're very photorealistic. His early work, they're these portraits of people. They're like ID photos. Mm -hmm. But I would look at them in books, and they're like, wow, that's really great. That really looks so real and it's like evocative. And stuff. I didn't realize they were eight feet high. These guys got paintings that are eight feet high, four feet wide. It was so cool to go to a show, something like that. Have you, you ever worked on a canvas that size? Uh, no. Would you? Yeah. Is, is it intimidating at all? The size factor? I would I wouldn't adjust what I'm the size of my work. Nice. It would just be in the middle. That great punching <laughs> bag thing I just <laughs> saw with your oh, but yeah. face. Yeah. What is the caption on that one? You uh, pointed the that out. Unpopular punching bag sleeping bag. Yeah. Oh man, was that fucking great. Thanks. Yeah, I, I just draw those on my phone. I have a stylus. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can just draw on my phone and upload those little So each day I just kinda Today's little. drawing. I follow you on the Twitter. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll follow you after our whatever. Uh, it's cool. <laughs> Does this guy have like a couple million people or something? No, no, no. Nowhere no. near. <laughs> Please. Not even a quarter. Does it even, you know, I don't even. I, Not I, even I, a I quarter. 203,000. I don't know oh, the exact that's number. Nice. I always wonder, like, what, when would I care or be satisfied with those kinds of, you know what I mean? What number here's what do you I feel just validation million. at? You know, does really. it matter? Like, what, what's the difference? I don't here, know. Here's, here's what I just realized. Uh, I wake up every morning with a couple hundred thousand followers. If I tweet, I'm going to make a sandwich. Seventeen of those couple hundred thousand go, oh yeah, what kind of sandwich? Right. And then when I tell them what kind of sandwich I've just had, two people go, mmm. <laughs> so I've had a couple hundred thousand people in the palm of my hand, right. and I've reduced it to two people going, it's your focus mm. group. <laughs> what I like is your first sentence. I wake up every morning with a couple hundred thousand followers. <laughs> In any other era, you have to be like a world leader or like Genghis Khan. You have to be a killer. You have to be Const Constantine the Great. Yeah. Now, at some point, Hitler you can be Kevin Pollack. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's such a weird time we live in. Right. I wake up in the morning with I a couple hundred thousand. wake up every morning thousand. with a couple hundred thousand people like this. <laughs> or so in my mind. That's how I see my followers. I, I was. I realized recently that attention. You know how they say matter can neither be created or n nor destroyed, right? right? Some law energy, of physics. Yeah. yeah, energy. It's, it's. I think it's similar with attention, in as much as you know how the human mind you can't pay attention to more than so many things at once. Right. Like we're just limited. You can do maybe two or three things at once. And then it becomes multitasking. Then it's multitasking, but even there, it, I think it becomes even task switching. It's right. like what you're doing is you're paying attention for very short increments, and you're yeah. bouncing back and forth. Well, it's funny if you think. In any moment, there's a finite amount of that you can do, which means in any hour, any day, therefore any lifetime. It would be a lot, but there's only so much attention you have to give to the world, to your life, that I have to give, that anybody has to give. So it's now funny that there's so many different outlets, so many different ways to create things that grab attention. Yeah, it's all about finding a niche. Right, but in, it, the, the amount that's available to be given doesn't change. Didn't change at all. You know what I mean? So like we're just fighting for scraps in this weird zero-sum game. It's like... Uh, completely fighting for scraps. That's why I'm... I'm in fact, die. only in this lifetime... <laughs> it's in tune. What's about to happen? in tune for the last I'm 25 minutes. Trying to get minutes, your clip bar, Antoon. Just eat it. Has been crying <laughs> and sweating. <laughs> To silently pull open this a clip. clip here, here. I was gonna say we could open it on camera. Out of his <laughs> By the way, also the other thing Much about the attention word. span that's been accepted <laughs> in our our way of thinking is that you can be talking to me and telling me a story, and if I'm doing this while you're talking, at some point you're okay with it. That's right. You've actually embraced. He can still hear me. Yeah. He's actually listening to me. That's right. He just has to do this really important thing right now, and he's about to go. Sorry, sorry. What? Right. I'm, I'm one, I'm right. You just you can you can kind of stagger. I had a bit on my show. It was a. I had a, a product. It was a. It was a phone that has a projector, mm -hmm. so that you could shoot the 
text onto the person's forehead you're talking to. So while you're texting, it looks like, you're, it looks like you're paying attention, but you're just reading off their forehead. <laughs> How did was, you... That was one of our bits. We, we rigged up a tiny projector and we got to do it. It was really fun in the, in the, in the bit. I'm like at a party talking to a girl. I'm like, uh-huh, uh-huh. And I'm just going like this, just shooting a text at her forehead. <laughs> That's genius. Yeah, it was fun. What do we call it? I think it was the forehead. And I can't remember. How much fun did you have writing in sketch form? It was because uh, it's abstract. It was pretty fun. It was uh, that was never my ambition. Right. I just like jokes. You know, yeah. when I started, I just wanted to do jokes. Because you've always been about work. an economy of words. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Your structure is such that they're basically abstract thoughts. I think so. Yeah. That are uh, structured in such a way that allow for comedic timing and perspective yeah. and point of view, but in a very thin. Yeah. Simple economy of words. Yeah, like... Huge part of it. Yeah, because even Gary Larson, I always mention when I was a kid, he was another one for me where I could look at a drawing and there were no words. Some of those, like, he just puts images. They're just lines that go together. Right. And it's, like, a, such an interesting communication that just a gestalt. You just look at it and then all of a sudden there's a reveal built into how your eyes scan it or something. But it's so economical rather than reading a whole comic strip. Yeah. You have to read all these word bubbles and these conversations to get to some shitty joke. Yeah. As opposed to just one panel to get to a hopefully a good joke. I remember well, you mentioned Carson. I remember somebody asked him what his, if he, after all these years towards the end he remembered what his favorite joke was. Wow, that's and a he good said question. for the last uh, 40 years, 30 years, whatever it was, it was a ridiculously long time. His favorite joke was a single panel cartoon. Mm. And it might have been Larson actually wow. because it was of a sweltering hot jungle scene with two hippos barely out of the water and I mean it's sweltering you can feel yeah. the atmosphere in this single panel beautifully detailed scene in a jungle and the, just the two hippos and the caption is one of them is saying you know I can't get it in my head it's Tuesday <laughs> That's great. just a single panel <laughs> so simple so simple so great and uh, I, I, it stuck with me all always that that was so interesting, Can't Johnny fathom Carson. All the jokes I know. someone like that has heard. Anywho, that's um, interesting. And was that going on that show? You know, I think even as a comic and a fan of comedy, I can't appreciate what that world was like. Where Carson was it. I mean, people always talk about, it, but it's true, right? Like Carson was the show. It's like I mean, especially maybe even before your time, but. Right? Still, for you when you were coming up, like Carson... Yeah. It's, no, no. There's no Carson today. It's not even like the person. It's like the structure of the television there's landscape. a half dozen right. diluted versions right. of a kingmaker. Right. Whereas he was... He the, was it. He was it. And people would sort of come up against him over the years and try to come into late night. It was a weird thing. Like Arsenio look. was like hot, but he had a run, right? But even then, that was towards the end. I mean, right. Jerry Lewis came into the late night scene, lasted about six weeks. Uh, really? Yeah. Alan Thicke was wow. enormous in Canada. He was called the Carson of Canada. Wow. Before he was on a sitcom here, he had this huge, huge, gigantic talk show late night in Canada. Thick of the night. Thick of the night. They brought here. In fact, wasn't Arsenio that his sidekick? That should work. That should work. <laughs> yeah, that should work. Thick of the night. <laughs> Come on. Come on. on. We've already got I have to give credit to title. Corey type Thick of the Night first before Sam said I didn't see. No, 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 but I just want to say that Corey was right there. I will I say that. Thick of the night. If it were Thick of the Night and Night had a K, more interesting. <laughs> 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 and there is your abstract thought. There it is. Um... I want to hear about, uh, uh, to answer your question, if I hadn't, then yes. Yeah. It, it was, um, there was only one. The fantasy was to get on that show in any way, shape, or form to, as a stand-up to walk out, do your bit, yeah. and have Carson not just do this, but to call you over to be what they called spontaneously paneled. Yeah. Because I grew up from such an early age watching all these comedians, and when I was young, there were so few comedians that had been on The Tonight Show, you could actually collect them like baseball cards. Wow. Because it had only been a couple dozen at most. By the time I got to Los Angeles as a stand-up, having sort of risen to the scene in San Francisco and moved here, hundreds upon hundreds, almost thousands of comedians had been on yeah. that little star and did their six minutes and got this. Right, okay. So I got it into my head when I was 26 that I want to be on the couch. Yeah. I just want to be on the couch like Albert Brooks and Steve Martin and yeah. Don Rickles and these guys so great. who do their act in the form of a conversation but on the couch because now they're sitting next to the king, yeah. making the king laugh. Which I think is harder. 
I, th I think it's hard. I mean, they're both challenging. But no, the you're couch, right. It's like, in, God, in a sense, to, it has to be a conversation. And also, know? Carson wouldn't suffer fools, so it's all, it, right. instantly harder. Right. Um, and, but no greater uh, moment of of um, validation, validation and success in a Tonight Show appearance if you make the king laugh while sitting next right, to him. Right. Right. So when I was asked to do the Tonight Show the very first time by the gatekeeper. Peter uh, LaSalle? No, before, at the time the second producer uh, was Jim McCauley. And he was the guy that would circle the comics at the t uh, clubs in Los Angeles. Comedy store and improv, really. And that's, it's so interesting, like that, I think a people guy. often don't r realize, like, a guy, right, he's the gateway. It's like, Yeah, I mean, yes I remember getting no. to town, people going, well, McCauley's going to like you. Who's McCauley? And he's in charge of booking the acts of the Tonight Show. and. When he says you're ready, that's the mm. only time you're ready. It doesn't matter who you think you are. You're not ready until this guy says so. And this guy also, if you if he calls up somebody in prematurely, knew and lived in fear that Carson would rip off his head and shit down his right. neck if he called up the room, right. right? So he would circle you forever. So when he finally said you're ready, he also knew you had to have two shots ready because if Carson loved you, he might bring you back in four weeks. Wow. So Macaulay wouldn't even come near you unless you had two shots ready. But by the time he came to me, I had it in my brain that I wanted to do the couch. Interesting. So I said, I know you can't justify bringing him to the couch. I know there's a protocol. I have to be in a movie or a TV show. Right. You don't bring comedians to the couch. But I'm willing to wait until so, I, I have anything yeah. that will justify bringing him to the couch, and then I'll do my characters and impersonations on the couch. I didn't have a really... That's, that's interesting foresight. So you were like, all right. But I didn't even have... It'll happen. Not only did I not have auditions at the time for a TV show or a movie, I didn't have an agent or any prospects for wow. a TV show audition. And so did he say, okay? He said, you're crazy. <laughs> and you're right. You will have a better impact on the couch doing your impressions for Johnny, because Johnny did impressions too. So it was really stacked when I finally got there a little over a year later. Not bad. Well, shocking. It was just the way things yeah. worked out. Yeah. Um, that's the funny thing. In hindsight, I can say, "Wow, a year." That's not I know. Bad. At the time, <laughs> at the been, time, you're not like, "Cool, in a year, I'll, I'll be on this tonight show." Yeah, yeah. It could have been never. It could have been yeah. <laughs> it could yeah. have been never. Yeah. Um, but so uh, the reason I went into such details because I am actually curious about any experiences you may had where you kind of took the reins a little bit of your own destiny. We get very few opportunities in our business, anyways. I can't speak on other industries yeah. to actually. Not just get on the train because the train's calling. Yeah. But to go, you know what? This way is better for me. Yeah. This is a this is a potentially once in a lifetime opportunity that you're offering me, but I need to try it this way. Yeah. Do you have you had kind of you know what I tell my friends? Two things I think I've learned about that kind of stuff is number one, if you have a dream, it seems like the closer you get to it, the more attractive the exits become. It's like the closer and closer you get to this thing that you might really want or feel like you should be doing, you get these chances to do stuff that you don't even maybe really want. Right. But they're so attractive in a way you think, well, that's, I'll just do that. Oh, wow, cool. But in your heart of hearts, maybe you're like, I don't think that's. Well, what that's I'm, what I mean what about I'm getting after. on the train. Yeah, they're right, right, yeah. So, I don't know, you know, um, writing a Conan. Thanks, for, by the way, you guys said I was there for four years. I was only there for a year, but you gave me more, more work. So I'm going to see if I can get paid for those extra three. But like writing a Conan. We actually had the checks, and that's why I mentioned <laughs> That's great. Yeah. I love this show. That was the, that was the, I wanted that job. In right. New York, that was the job for writing. Nobody ever quit Conan to get a sketch writing job at Conan. Kidding? There were like 10 spots. Nobody ever quit. Conan's a great guy. The, like, uh, the head writer uh, was Mike Sweeney when I was there before him. It was Jonathan Groff. Right. Both great guys. You know, it was a really good work environment. And you wouldn't have to have a day job anymore because right. I was temping. I tried, I think, two or three times and I finally got hired at Conan. You know, because 100 people would apply for one position or something. And I'd make my packet each time. It was 12 thing, 12 sketches in paragraph form. Didn't get it the first time, didn't get it the second. Then I got it. I wanted that so badly. And then I got it and it was a great job. But a year later, I found myself quitting. It and, came at a strange time. Yeah. According to the dossier, yeah. the phone call came while you were at the Fringe Festival. Yeah. Um, but sh shortly before you actually did your show and went on to win yeah. the ultimate prize. Yeah. 
but you were at the Fringe Festival right. in this incredible environment as a performer, right? And you get a call from your agent saying, "By the way, you can write on Conan now." Right, you got it. You got this job. I'm like, oh, that's wow. a weird. It was weird timing. That was really weird timing because, I figure I started stand up in '97, and then that was when I dropped out of school and had no money, no job or anything. So I did temping, sure. answering phones, and then I trained to be a proofreader. That was better because I didn't have to talk. <laughs> So I could write jokes while I was proofreading. If I thought of a joke, I could jot it down, and right. I could go work for eight hours and just daydream, you know, because it's just kind of comparing two documents often. I don't have to read for content. So that's my life. I'm working 40, 50 hours a week, and I'm a proofreader. And I'm doing stand-up at night and whenever I can get on. By the time I write a one-man show and I get to go to a festival, that's a big leap for me. Now someone's sponsoring me to go to Scotland. I did that show for a month. That was, you know, you, do, you go to that festival, and you do an hour every night for 30 nights in a row. Jesus. So you, and you do the same show, and people come, they say, oh, he's in this theater. Okay, so every night at 8 o'clock, this guy, if you want to see him, you go to that theater. 1,200 shows in the city. Population of the city doubles. It's unbelievable. The average audience size is eight people. It's really hard to get people to come to your show. So for me, that was a whole little Cinderella story that I, my show sold out, and I added extra shows, and then I won the trophy and everything. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a finalist there. I'm one of the nominees for this prize. When by the, the way, phone call comes. Yeah, by the way, comedy prizes are hilarious to me. I mean, right, of course. It's, it's like a painting prize. Okay, fine. Like I, That blue is nicer, I guess, than <laughs> the blue you have here. Great. Here's a trophy. Oh, yeah. wow, great. A piece of metal. I, this is awesome. I could put this in my house. Uh huh. Um, Mine keeps melting. <laughs> I got some I got you got some it? career achievement award, and it keeps melting. Really? <laughs> like, it's because it's a beautiful piece of art. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> That's doing this. So you have to move it? To, it's in your fridge now? It just reminds me of my career. Just <laughs> Your slowly, career can't be in the slowly sun. Slowly melting. Yeah, to keep my career cannot be in the sun. <laughs> you have to keep it away from windows. <laughs> Is it your streaming, Kevin? <laughs> no, the, the streaming stands tall. Correct. <laughs> so, so I'm nominated for this trophy, which is great because for me, of course, Probably a lot of it really is about you get work. It's so also great, you know what I mean? symbolic of the climb during the 30 days. It's yeah. really about rising to, Jesus, yeah. I went from eight people to, yeah, I'm the thing, I'm it. That's true, yeah. yeah. So that's, it's the night before they're going to announce who wins that prize. And I get the call that I get the job on Conan one day. And then I think that was the day before. The next day I get a call. Uh, before I win this prize, uh, hey, Woody Allen's casting person gave him your tape from when you did stand-up on Letterman. What do you, what, what do you saw your stand-up? And he wants you to read for the lead in his next movie. Jesus. Um, Robert Downey Jr. was supposed to be the lead, but they're having insurance problems. This is 2003. This is a while ago. Sure. We, we're uh, not sure we can get Robert Downey they're, they're Jr. Having insurance we're thinking you Yeah, might. exactly. I'm thinking, what are, what are you talking about? Is this a joke? He said, no, no. He liked your stand-up. Gets weirder. He's at the Venice Film Festival. He's going to come over. He's flying through Paris on his way back to New York. You're flying through Paris. My manager at the time's like, I know you're connecting through Paris to get back to New York from Edinburgh, from Scotland. If you can delay your layover in Paris, you'll get to... Have, have this meeting? You'll get to audition for Woody Allen in his hotel room in Paris. I've had about two auditions in my life at that point. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a trained actor. I've never had an acting class. Right. I do one-liners. What the hell? I just did my first one-man show. I'm going to read for Woody Allen in Paris in a hotel room? Of course. <laughs> but I'm just like, shit, you're kidding me. Like, couldn't this have come That's the my one on... chance, you know, to read for Woody Allen? You That's figure... the getting on the train thing. Right. So, um, yeah, okay, of course, I'll, I'll delay my trip, you know. So I go, to, I go to Paris on a Tuesday. The audition's on, it will be on a Saturday. Now I have five days in Paris. I don't speak French. I don't know anybody. This is 2003. The cell phones aren't than what they are now. I can't call people and text them. Right. So it's, I have a mini disc player. <laughs> you said 2003, right? Not 1993? <laughs> right. Okay. 2003. <laughs> if they had mini disc in 1993, I would be like, no. This is, yeah, 2003, I got my mini disc. I remember I had a mix on it. Sure. And I'm in Paris, so what the hell am I going to do? So I walk around uh, Paris each day and I'm just thinking, how do I prepare? I go to internet cafes and I Google Woody Allen audition experience. Because, you know, it's cold reading. And I'm just Googling it. And they're all like, yeah, I talked to him for five minutes. He was really nice. And I got a call. Oh, yeah, I got the no, you don't get to see any script or pages ahead of time. Nothing. Oh, God. You just go and you just show up. And so I'm thinking, this is crazy. I mean, is this a joke? I swear, I, swear, I kept thinking, someone's playing a joke on me. This is so weird. But now you're on your way home. You've got the prize. So I got this trophy. Yeah, so I feel good. <laughs> and uh, 
I'm walking around, I remember, okay, here's my research. I'll go to Shakespeare and Company. I know there's an English bookstore. They have English books. Okay. Have English. And I get, I get a, a, some book about Woody Allen, and then I get a couple DVDs I find. I hadn't seen a lot of Woody Allen movies at that point. I've seen some, like Annie Hall in Manhattan. I'd seen some very famous ones. But I was thinking, let me do some more research here. Right. And like an idiot, the one I get is Zelig. Oh my God. I don't know what Zelig is. So I get <laughs> Zelig to kind of study a Woody Allen movie for performance and stuff. And of course, it's the one that's like, or not, it's one of the ones that's not really going to help you so not much. At it's all. like just archival footage and like voiceover and stuff. So I'm watching Zelig in my hotel room thinking, I'm, I'm fucked. What am I doing here? Yeah. And um, anyway, long story short, or long story medium, I go and uh, I show up on the Saturday, and I've been in my head all week trying to figure out what am I doing here? What Psyching do I do? yourself out. Psyching myself out, and I'm fine in front of an audience. Right. I bomb whatever. I do my thing. It works or it doesn't. But auditioning, I don't know how to do that. Right. You know, so I show up to the hotel, and I go to the Ritz Carlton. This giant. The doors are like crazy. Three people high. Very impractical, but it's a revolving <laughs> door that's like you know, a sailboat. It's like a sail. And they have this really nice courtyard, or I don't know, it's like whatever a driveway is that's really fancy, that it's like cobblestone. Circular. Yeah, some circular cobble. cobblestone, very unnecessary. Mm -hmm. You know, that's like very fancy. It's like this is difficult for a car. Like this is supposed to be <laughs> this good. This is good for no one. This is, yeah. Um, so they have that, and I, I show up, and I go inside and say, hi, I'm here to see. My contact was not Woody Allen, somebody else. And they're like, we don't know that person. Like, Come on. <laughs> My name is Dimitri Martin. Like, we, I'm sorry, we can't help you. We don't know. I was like, I can't believe this. I stayed in this like, for a week in Paris. Like, this is not happening. And is the time wrong? You can't call people back home? So I go, there's a phone booth in the, in the lobby there, and I go in there and call with like a calling card to my manager. What the hell's going on? Like, what am I doing here? This is ridiculous. Like, it's not happening. And then I see Soon Yi come through the giant revolving door. So I say, okay, I got to go. Click. So I'm thinking, all right, so I guess he's here. So then I go and I tell them. And now all of a sudden they're like, oh, yeah, okay, hold on, just a couple minutes. And then they bring me up. Because you said it with authority? What made the difference, I wonder? I don't know. Well, the first time they're like, eh, fuck you. I think I said it with more anxiety, like more like Woody Allen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you he's here. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I just, I, I don't know what it was. I guess they came back from shopping uh -huh. and said, there's some guy here. And then maybe one of his assistants or something said, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll send him up in a couple minutes. Thank goodness. So then I go up, and I knock on this giant door. It's this presidential suite, and the door opens, and just Woody Allen pops his head out. <laughs> He's like, oh, hey, hey, thanks for coming. Come on in. <laughs> it's so weird. It's surreal. Like, so I go inside, and he's very friendly, because I had read stuff where he didn't look at me. Right. There was no eye contact, you know. So I'm thinking, I don't want to bother this guy. So I go in there, and he's really friendly. He's really nice, and he's asking me questions, and I'm totally off guard now, because right. I was thinking, all right, it's formal. And I don't, like you were saying, I don't really get nervous usually, especially for performing. That would be a terrible job. I know. If like every day for my job, I felt like I was going to shit in my pants or something. It's like, <laughs> what a terrible it's like job. A picture a bus you... driver being like, oh my God, I got to drive this thing. Yeah. So, <laughs> but for an audition, again, I don't know how to do this. So, so I'm like kind of stammering. And he's like, yo, where are you from? I said, I'm from New Jersey. My parents are from Brooklyn. He's like, we're from Brooklyn. And he's saying to the other woman, oh, we're from Brooklyn. God bless you. You're right. <laughs> and, um, uh, anyway, so he goes, anyway, I have some sides here. And he gives me two pages. And he goes, tell you what, you, you, will you be more comfortable in here? How about in here? And he brings me into his bedroom. He says, here, in here. I said, okay. He's just like, just come get me when you're ready. I said, can I take a, he's like, you know, a couple minutes. I was like, five minutes? He's like, five minutes, one minute, you know, whatever you need. Kind of like, he's like, come on, man. Just <laughs> so now I'm in I'm Woody Allen's hotel room in Paris. The guy's like in another part of this suite, and I'm looking in a mirror, like any asshole who doesn't know how to act. I'm I'm looking in a mirror doing the lines. I don't know what you're supposed to do. So I'm like <laughs> reading the lines in the mirror. I'm like, is this how like what am I doing? Oh god, this, this is horrible. This is horrible. So then I come out of the room and he's not there. Now I'm in the main suite. There's no nobody's there. Hello? So I'm back in his bedroom. I'm just doing the lines more. I don't know what the hell to do. And uh, he comes back, he's like, Were you looking for me? I said, Yeah. He's like, you ready? I said, yeah. I've been doing the lines in the mirror for a while, and I'm starting to lose confidence. I think we should just do this. He's like, you sure you don't want to work in the mirror some more? I was like, you said that? <laughs> yeah. I said, no, I think I'm good. <laughs> so then we just, we did it. So I'm doing the, I'm doing the, 
So I'm doing the scene with his sister, I found out later, is wow. who's traveling with him. I didn't realize it was his sister. I'm doing the scene with his sister. And uh, he's like, go ahead. I don't, I don't need an Academy Award. Just, I just want to see how you sound. You know, just go ahead. Whenever you're ready. I don't need an Academy Award. Yeah, he's like, you're you know, thinking, that's convenient. No, he's like, yeah, he's like, I don't, yeah, exactly. He's like, I don't need some major performance. Oh, great, okay. So I'm doing the scene, and I finish. He's like, oh, do it again. So I do it again, and now I notice out of the corner of my eye, so we're on a couch, there's a coffee table here, Woody Allen's where you're sitting, and uh, I'm doing the scene, and I notice out of the corner of my eye, he goes, oh, <laughs> oh, shit. I just see him squint, and I'm like, oh, no. But then, I swear to God, I see him go, he puts his hands up like a director, mm -hmm. and he starts walking around the room, like kind of doing a semi, like an arc. Like wow. looking at me from different angles while I'm doing the scene, and now I'm thinking, is this guy just fucking with me? Like, does he just know? <laughs> I still, to this day, don't know if he was like, uh, I guess I should give this guy a show. I mean, <laughs> I should be a director or something for him. You know what I mean? Because I did it like three or four times. He's like, just do it a few times, you know, to get comfortable. So I'm and just giving no direction, by the way, no notes in between. Nothing. Just do it again. Just do it again. So I just did it three or four times, and he no, no, never saying try this, try that. I don't think so. Maybe once he said slow down or something, or not as, not so shitty or something. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so no no real direction. Very nice, very friendly. Well, what it was, was really it like cool. on set? I mean, how oh, long did you guys set, shoot it, on the picture? It was great. So I shot the movie. That sounds like most of my auditions. And then, and I, okay. so I assume you got it. <laughs> I didn't get the, didn't get the movie. <laughs> no? Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, of course. So it was Melinda Melinda. So Will Ferrell got the part, which I didn't feel so bad about when I heard. <laughs> yeah. If it was like Jason Schwartzman or some guy who I kind of resemble, I'd be like, oh. <laughs> I really blew it, you know what I mean? But it's, uh, I don't look that much like Wolf Ferrell. I think we're different types. I think the feedback was really nice. They said a couple days later, uh, Woody thought you were uh, really great and charming and funny, whatever he said. A uh, little green, a little young, but he's a fan. Congrats, you know, he liked your stuff. So that was a thrill. That was kind of, yeah. that, was, that was nice. It was, what I took away from it more than anything was, it's so interesting that you're in a room with this guy this older guy, he's kind of a little guy, and um, if you were a casting movie star, you know, right? They always say, like, Woody Allen doesn't look like the traditional. It's not like he looks like Brando or... Anyone again, traditional. Let me pick somebody from the 50s again, but you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but he doesn't, he doesn't look like what we think, this all-American kind of movie star. Mm -hmm. But just the power of that guy's um, creativity right. and how prolific he is. Right. Prolificness? What's, yes. the, what's his, the his body of work? This is his body of work. Ridiculous. It's ridiculous. So, I just walked away feeling so inspired, like that this guy made. Talking about writing your ticket, I always think of Woody Allen and Albert Brooks. I mean, we're talking about Albert Brooks before the show started. It's like those are two guys who wrote their they and, wrote their parts for themselves. And by the way, they were able to do that on the back of original thinking stand up. Yes, that's where it started for both of them. Right, they were original thinking in their act, in their presentation, they weren't like everyone else. That's right. And they were able to get the right people in a position of power to say, a few of which, like Jon Stewart, have said to you in the case of working on The Daily Show, we don't want you to try to fit into what we're doing here. Right. We don't want you to be a typical correspondent. We like what you do. Right. How, to, how can do we... Do something for us. Yeah. How can we get that to... Yeah. Right. Which is nice. That's a, such a treat. And those are nice surprises, I think, along the way. But I, I learned early on, I started, I just wanted to do stand-up. And again, I don't know for you, you transitioned to acting. But uh, without training also. Without training also, right. So you, you, you got a sense, you know what, I, I don't want to do scenes. I want to be in stuff maybe, do scene work. Once, once I started to realize some of the ideas that I was coming up with didn't really work as one-liners and even as different bits on stage, I started to just keep notes to say that could be a short story or that could be you know, a scene or a movie idea hmm. or maybe that's a... Uh, just a single panel drawing, whatever it is. Once I started doing that, I realized, okay, I look how I look, I am what I am. If I'm ever gonna be in a movie, it'll be one that I wrote. And so it was like, not only will I not take the train, I gotta learn how to lay track. Like I gotta go, oh, shit. I gotta do every part of this if I wanna do this. Right. And I'm not gonna worry about um, anybody doing me any favors, of casting me in their thing, because it's probably not gonna happen and I'm not gonna worry about it, I'll just, I'll do it my way. Which would seem like a natural transition to go right to working with Ang Lee and starring in a film for right. an Academy Award winning director. But instead, I'm going to do this ad read for Bowflex. 
That's great. <laughs> you know why? They both involve strenuous effort, so they're not that different. <laughs> Both we so believe in beautiful, sweet, smooth transitions. I love it. And I like to counter uh, intuitive thinking in terms of <laughs> how to do a show. And I'm thinking, here's this beautiful transition, and I'm just going to shit all over it. Bowflex is a company that's built on surprising people. <laughs> yes, with surprising <laughs> results. <laughs> surprising results, because one of our... Um, Recent and now longtime uh, sponsors is, in fact, Bowflex, the fine peeps there uh, who have this incredible piece of equipment uh, that you've seen us run the video of me doing Christopher Walken on this machine that combines a Stairmaster and a treadmill and a elliptical. Uh, if you call 1 800 436 6063, uh, to find out about their Tread Climber info kit, that number again, 1 800 3660063 or request online walkwithkevin.com. That sounds religious. Right? <laughs> walkwithkevin. Well, he's got a lot of followers. <laughs> that makes sense. Right. He's got I that, have hundreds more followers, if I may, than. Let's not the say it. Let's not say it. I didn't mean to say that we were better than <laughs> Jesus. I just meant we were better dresses. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so there you have it. Thank you, Bowflex, for being a proud sponsor of Kevin Pollack's chat show. Thanks, Bowflex. Are they proud? Yep. Okay. I checked in. You checked in? I they're, checked they're in with Mr. Mr. Bowflex, they're who's fits. the nephew. John Bowflex? Mm -hmm. They're Johnny. a fit sponsor. Johnny Bowflex. Johnny Bowflex. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Junior. And he said, you know, we're a little proud. And I went, I'm going to take that to the bank, Johnny. You know what? Little proud is still proud. Yeah. Jonathan Bowflex, the people who don't know him well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In fact, Johnny Bowflex sounds like a guy you're sending to get his shine box. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all a proud sponsor. Um, I do want to talk about Ang Lee, but first, other than Bowflex, I think it's time for us to play a little Who Tweeted. All what right. in the world? How about it? Let's have a little fun. Pull the thing. Oh, this is yeah. going to be a treat. Celebrities have so much to say. Who tweeted? Is the game we're going to play. <laughs> How about that? What the hell was that? Yeah, it's brand new in your absence. <laughs> that is crazy. Yeah, man. All right. Help uh, re-explain how this works, With, It's been so many, so many weeks since we've played this. I have to re-explain it to myself. All right. So you're on the Twitters. Yes. You know who else is on the Twitters? Tyra. Paris. Justin Bieber. Excellent. They're crazy. They write some crazy they stuff. They have a lot of ideas, those people. So uh, what I'm going to do is it's a game here. You and uh, Kevin are going to go head to head. Right. Tete a tete. As it were. Did you go a little Frenchy? A little French. <laughs> you went a little Frenchy? <laughs> you know, I came back with the beard from France, so <laughs> I have to keep speaking it until I shave. The password is affectation. That's right. I left the beret at home. Now, series of eight tweets. I'm going to read a tweet, and then you and Kevin are going to ring in and tell me who wrote it. Tyra, Paris, Bieber. Okay. Sound easy enough? And okay. we have three seconds once we buzz in. You get three, yeah. Buzz in, say your name, because uh, then I'll point to you. You get three seconds to Instead say. of going buzz, we're right. hitting the table. We find a lot of people just hit the table. Okay. Because they think they're on Jeopardy right. or something. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. I guess on. Jeopardy would be this. As long as they don't hit it in like a... Right, don't knock something over. <laughs> yeah. Creepy way. Actually, yeah. that's kind of nice. <laughs> if you hit the table like that, I'm going right. to give you the so, prize money. So do whatever you'd like. So the rules are... We buzz in after you finish the question. Uh, you, at, at, any point. at any point, if you feel like you know who, who okay. Uh, okay. wrote the tweet. Okay. Is there a right prize involved? There is the indeed a prize. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What could it be? How about this? Hmm. Cab Whoa. fare. Green piece of to paper. To get from here. To is that dancing Andrew Brentwood. Jackson? Watch this. He can dance. Oh, yeah. So that's oh, right off bitch. the table. I like that. Huh? You, you know what's funny is that, isn't it weird that when these first came out, the head looks so deformed, having a big head on the dollar. And now when I see one with a small head, it looks like, what like a baby who was malnourished. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he got it's back like, from some like, What African... happened to the president? Yeah. Huh? Head shrinking. I should say what happened to that president. Uh, whatever president. happened to Jackson? He didn't get his due. All right. Here, so we, here go. we go. Are you ready to play Who Tweeted? I like you did your last initial first. I know. That I, was I weird. put a D here and I went to put an M <laughs> over here. And I, I somehow managed to save it as if I, I wouldn't. I saw you struggling. <laughs> I really the, was. Your P looks. That's an M. That's the beginning of an M. All right. Sorry, Sammy. Didn't mean to take away from your dance, you son of a bitch. No, no sweat. Okay, so. Tyra Paris Got Bieber. It. Got it. Ring in. Tweet by, number one. You buzz in by saying your name. Halle Berry's cover and spread of March issue of Ebony Magazine. Wow. Kevin, Kevin Tyra. 
You said Demet kind of before me. I give it to you. I, I, I'm, I'm Were you going to say Tyra? I'm Dark Horse now. That is correct. Huh? That is correct. Oh, did you oh, yeah, mention I forgot. I forgot the, the point system? Sorry, I'm rusty. Can you lose a point by getting one wrong? Yes. You lose three points by getting one wrong. You get five points for getting it correct. Great. There you go. <laughs> Great. So <laughs> He's already. Such a good competitor. Great. Already. I like your rules. <laughs> Here we go, tweet number two. very fair. So excited to read the interview. Dimitri. <laughs> Bieber. <laughs> if you get that right, you should automatically get to 20. There's no way you can possibly know based on what he said. I'm afraid that's incorrect. <laughs> what was the rest of that? That was so fucking hilarious. To read the interview I did with Lil Wayne in the new Interview magazine. I'm still saying Bieber. Now I would have gone with Bieber now. <laughs> I really enjoyed interviewing him. Okay. That was Paris. Oh, interviewing him. Inter interviewing okay. him. Now. There we go. Paris. Yeah. And by interviewing, of course, we mean asking questions and writing down the answers. You know, I was uh, Fist pumping. once, I don't know why I mentioned this, a million years ago, I was given the opportunity to interview you for, I want to say, Mean Magazine. Ah. And uh, I got the email at like 1 in the afternoon. And I was finishing a phone call. I got back at like 1.30. They were like, sorry, we didn't hear back from you. We gave the job to somebody else. Like, well, you, you, I thought you, you took a call. You missed pass. very little. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. Tweet number three. All right. At this elementary school dance, it's 50 the 50s themed. Love all the poodle skirts. So cute. I love spending time with kids. They are so sweet. Dimitri. Three Paris. Seconds. That is correct, sir. Wow, I would have gone you Bieber. You are on the board. On the That was I'm awesome. On, I'm on the board. No, Bodie, you are off the schnock. <laughs> Nicely done. Let me tell you. Nicely done. Tweet number four. So I thought I had been tweeting all day, but my phone wasn't working. Sweet. Now I don't remember anything I said. Kevin Beaver. That is correct. Whoa! Wow. That's correct. Kevin's. We've played this game, by the way, skills. before, where the guest and I didn't get any right the entire <laughs> all, all the way down. We're three for four. We're kicking ass. You guys are doing very That's well. That's good. You're but I've never well. gotten two right, by the way. So you know, <laughs> I'm way ahead of my own curve. Tweet Wait, number. So that's so that was we've done four. That we've was done four. Tweet number, four. Tweet number five. Okay. There's eight tweets total. Okay. Unless of course there's this. a tie. I can still win. You can this. still totally dominate. Tweet number five. Turn on CBS Sunday Morning right now, East Coasters. I'll be on in a few minutes. I hope you are encouraged to go for your dreams too. Dimitri Bieber. I agree. Oh no! We both were wrong. Tyra. And sadly, only you missed points, because I would have wrote, Tyra. I would have said Bieber as well. Tyra. It got, okay. a, it got a little quiet here, because I, I think now we feel bad. For, Tyra, for what? For you. Oh, I, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We want you to do Maybe well, I need to remind you. I've got real problems in life. <laughs> <laughs> Did yeah. you just break a little perspective? <laughs> this won't, this won't, uh, you have this a girlfriend you tolerate. Category. I've got a bleeding anus. <laughs> I don't think you people hey, realize. Hey, if you're English, that's not that bad. No, good point. Or is Wait, it bloody? I guess bloody. they don't say bleeding. <laughs> okay, it is that bad. <laughs> what a fine difference between bleeding and bloody. I've got in a Britain, bloody bleeding anus. To the Brits. I've got a bloody bleeding anus. All right, here we go. Tweet number six. I'll say. Come meet me March 29th at 5.30 p.m. at Sears... <laughs> Paris, you are in Mexico City. Hope to see you there. Come see me at Sears in Mexico City. Yep. Oh, I don't. I'm afraid to lose more points. <laughs> I'm not fucking lost. I'm gonna take this one, Kevin Bieber. No. What? Paris, fucking Hilton. <laughs> wow. Sears. What the fuck? Where America shops for value. It's amazing. Sears. That is so weird. Mexico's, Holy crap, Oli. Mexico's dangerous now. It's so dangerous. Sears is... Mexico City has like 20 million people in it. What is she doing there? Did she sleep with all of those guys? Two, three, four, five, six. Two questions left. There's a okay. six-point chasm. Tweet number seven. Halle Berry's cover... Wait a second, I already read that. It's the next one. Here we go. Sometimes I... You all right? You want to take a knee? Hell of brain aneurysm here. My uh, twos and sevens and ones all look the same. We're good. Tweet number seven. 
Sometimes I wish. A bingo operator. <laughs> the, one, the one time I actually called a bingo. <laughs> It was a I'm disaster. Tell it's a terrible story. Got a bingo story. <laughs> and I'm just going to say, he has a story for everything. Uh, it was in and Hamburger Mary's. Wait, that's that's new on your epitaph. It's going to say he had a system for everything and he had a story for everything. <laughs> I have a story, he had a story to boot. All right, <laughs> here we go. Tweet number seven. Sometimes I wish tennis shoes slash sneakers. Dimitri Bieber. <laughs> <laughs> He's the go-to now. Wrong. Oh, no. Fucking shit. Tyra. You're horrible. That's now, the right. last question is a 10-pointer, so it's up for grabs. Okay. This could still I'm go gonna either just way. Wait. I'm not going to try to Yeah, why not? Tweet number eight. Late night McDonald's in Germany. I wish they had a Tim Hortons. LOL. Okay, I know this one. You have to answer. Dimitri Bieber. Tim Hortons is Canadian. That guy's from Canada. That is correct! We got a winner! Ha ha! Pulls it out! Yeah! Wow, what a comeback. That was beautiful. We're going to say that one was worth 11 or 12 points. <laughs> it was worth 15. No, I, I lost, but that's fine, 12 right? points. Uh, oh, I see what you're saying. You add the 10. <laughs> there you go. He's still minus. He's still yeah, plus. He's, still, he's plus 6 if you add 10 to the... That's fine. Son of a bitch. What a comeback, though. <laughs> that dude just went... Wow. Wow. I can't believe he took well, the money. I can't. Is that what that was? Can't believe Kevin took the money. <laughs> he wants to talk so bad. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> that's um, that's kind of how you play. Mm -hmm. Who tweeted? Thanks, Sammy Levine. Thank you. You get him next time. Thanks. Thanks. Next time. Celebrities have so much to say. Who tweeted? Is the game that we just played. Let me tell you about Netflix. No, totally kidding. Totally <laughs> kidding. <laughs> Um, I, I thank you very much for participating yeah. in our fun and silly game. Uh, how, how are you enjoying uh, the Twitter? Because I follow you, and, and there's, I enjoy the hell out of the daily drawing, uh, or my drawing of the day, or, or however it's uh, named. But um, for an abstract a painter, dare I say, uh, in, in, as you represent in your stand-up and whatnot. I would think the, and also the palindrome, almost every, there's almost a haiku available to you in 140 characters. Yeah. Um, for a mind that thinks that way, yeah. uh, how do you enjoy, because it's all yeah. about editing too, with the yeah. 140 characters. You've got I, more I'm, important creative I'm things. not a natural fit for it, I think. I don't, I don't like, I don't know, I've, I've come to enjoy it a little bit more, but I've resisted for a couple of years. You know, I'm kind of new to it. I don't know. I like I like just going on stage and saying the stuff to people. Mm -hmm. To sit there typing little things to send out there. It's not my first instinct. I'm not really attracted to it. When I figured out I could put drawings up, they're not all intended to be jokes. Right. But they're just little ideas. I think at least that variation on it made it a little bit more interesting for me. Right. I like I I write jokes all the time and I try to keep them pretty short. Yeah, cuz I gravitate to that, but I like telling them. I don't like writing them so also, much. Also, you know it's I mean? that live uh, experience versus someone replying in their own version, and usually they try to be funny, yeah, which I is mean, annoying. Yeah, I think that, that can kind of get weird. So, And what you really want is just them going, <laughs> Yeah. That's it. I That's think, I, I, think really I, want. I just want to, I guess, it's like, I guess you have to do stuff so people know you still exist. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, I don't have some hit TV show, and I'm not really in movies, right? I'm get a little part here and there. So I'm like, all right, like let, let people know I'm still around. Yeah, and, but there are of... people who have chosen to uh, express their curiosity in the form of the word followers. So yeah. what, what they're saying is, is we're kind of yeah. into anything you want to share with us. I don't know, for you, how long have you been on there? A couple years. A couple years, yeah. So it's interesting to see people come on to it and then they go through this gestation. Yeah, tweet like crazy. It's about and this, the, it's about twittering. Yeah, it's very reflexive. It's very self-aware. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm tweeting in the shower. I'm t this, t you know, ridiculous. Tweet, tweet this, that, you know. Yeah, I don't know. Not that interesting to me. But I do think it's cool. I guess to get access to certain people and also to see one thing that is interesting about Twitter to me is that uh, there is the emergence of a body of work for anybody who has a feed. 
if they don't delete stuff, right? There's just a history. Yeah, right. So it's hard to escape yourself. If you want to get a sense of a person in the composite, I think you can. Right. Read one tweet, maybe not. Read two. Read 50 of them, you start getting, okay, I think I see what... This is a, what this person's after here. Yeah, this or, person is just self-serving and promoting. Yeah, this is this person's. It's a commercial, right. or it's. Um, oh, I see how they kind of joke around in their day-to-day -day life. I mean, that that's kind of interesting to me. I think, but. Well, I don't you're know. so prolific in your output, um, and also diverse in your uh, platforms, and dare I say, milieus, with your abstract thinking. For example, you carry a notebook. Mm -hmm. that you're doing kind of doodling mm. in on a daily basis. Yeah. And <clears throat> you were kind enough to bring it after my um, encouraging. Here's what I have. Encouragement. I think I brought my... I want to show you something. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the... No, let oh, me no. get it for Sam, you. Sam, thanks. Sammy's all over it. Cross uh, it. In the front pouch of my little backpack over there. Yeah, here, I'll let you. And by little I'll backpack, of course, you know he means his... Ta -da. I mean my, my lady. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll show you an example here. Okay. Uh, We've got camera zoom in capabilities now. Okay. This is dark. Every comic, I guess, has their kind of system. I carry these notebooks all the time. This is the smaller kind that I use that I can just keep in my back pocket, although I didn't for the interview. So in that one, I get to walk around and, like, I'll, I'll write down jokes. Can you see that? Come in tight. Tidy tight. Like jokes and drawings. What does the drawing say? Um, that one? It says, did you see the fins on that one? Nice. It's a bad drawing of fish, but <laughs> it's like this girl fish just swam by. And here's another one. It's a... Uh, Get in there, Kenny. It's a uh, hourglass with the remains of a dead watchmaker in it. It's a nice. Cre cremated watchmaker. So I'll just write little ideas, and then I don't know what's valuable. You know, it takes a while to figure out if something's useful or not. So I'll, I'll do little designs for even like a t-shirt or a joke or whatever, and that's just walking around. And then this one... More of a sketchbook? This one's a, one of my sketchbooks. And so that this one's P08. It's pocket notebook number eight. In a series? Yeah, so this kind of a notebook, I call my pocket notebook. So that way, because I, I lose track, and sure. like, I don't know what was in there, I'm looking for something. This one's 007. Which, of course, means... Other 07. <laughs> So this is the, of the other notebooks. This is number seven. No, sorry, I'm not doing this right. Okay. I don't know if that was worth it. Could showing. also be the James Bond notebook. <laughs> That's right. Technically. And so then I'll have like a set list in there. So that's like a set list for these the These are show. bits and ideas for your stand-up. Yeah, these are jokes. And then a circle means I thought the joke worked. Can I ask worked. what blinds are there in the middle, lower right? Uh, blinds. Yes. So the notation on that means, just so you know, it means that joke didn't work. So I'm going to tell you one of my shitty jokes from that night. The notation is the quotation marks? No, that's just part of the joke, remembering that it's about the word blinds. But like the circle means a joke kind of worked with that audience. A circle with a half means I think it did OK or it's worth doing again. Uh -huh. No, nothing means I didn't tell it. No, no, nothing means I told it and it didn't work. And parentheses mean I didn't tell it that night. Never got to it. Right. Got so it. blinds was. Uh, that seems like a very extreme name for what they do. It's like, it's sunny in here, blind me. <laughs> I don't want it a little dark. I want to be blind. I want it, right. blind me. You know, Should sort be of. a that, middle ground. That was the idea. Yeah. Shades, so, for example. Right, shades, I think is better. So, obviously with short jokes for me, it's very, uh, what's the word? I keep saying incremental, but that's the only word I can think of for it. Just little pieces along the way. So I have to kind of come up with a lot of them to fill, say, an hour or 90 minutes. Sure. So I'm always trying to keep track. So then these are some drawings. And I like to doodle and stuff. So this isn't one of these notebooks. So this is a dolphin getting high. <laughs> <laughs> it's simple. That's great. <laughs> Let me see if I had another one. That this one was, we this, love. This is one that was on my show that I always like. It's an R from behind. <laughs> <laughs> and I just love the ass of that R. Was, did that come to you as a single thought? Or is that something you work on? Uh, yeah, it's, to it's, get there? it's both for me. Like, I'm just walking around and stuff pops in my head. Right. Or I just doodle. Like, I find if I just move a pen, then ideas emerge from the shapes. You I know? noticed shortly after the R from behind or before it, there was a horse. Yes. With no... Uh, 
This was, oh, actually, this one's in my book. I did a, a nicer version of this. This is a, a pony with a second ponytail. <laughs> <laughs> two ponies, two tails on that pony. <laughs> I just I like the idea of the ponytail in nature. Sure. And then. Um, oh, I like that one a lot. Yeah, this one's a, a mermaphrodite. <laughs> <laughs> kind of disturbing. Not an it's easy a very, lot. very 70s. Kind of <laughs> Loggins and Messina kind of feel to that. <laughs> Loggins and Messina. Your references <laughs> oh, are beautifully <laughs> dated. <laughs> I'm very oh, dated. What's the oh, fish and this one? one's in the book too. So this is a funny notebook that I happen to have here because some of these are in the book. <laughs> so that's fish fart. <laughs> <laughs> and these are in the new book. The fish fart's in there and one of the other ones, I, uh, the ponytail. You know, so what happens for me is a lot of the fun for me is just walking around alone and just, it's like my own little show. You know what I mean? Just sure. writing and coming up with stuff. I feel like sometimes when I come up with a bit, it's like someone just told it to me. Right. It's so nice the first time it right. kind of comes into my head formed. Right. Or when I'm sleeping, I'll think of a joke and I'll wake up. And I'll think, Did I, was that my joke? Is that mine? And I'll write it down. Right. And then often those don't work. But when they do, then I'm thinking, great. So I thought that was funny the first time I thought of it. Right. And now the audience, they think it's funny too. So I have a piece that I can keep. You know? And did you incorporate the physical nature, the visual of your yeah. ideas when you first started, or how long did that take before you brought the visual into it, like the large pad that we saw at the top yeah, of the show? Yeah, so, so if I started in 97, I just did straight jokes. Most of the sets I do when I'm around town, if I'm in LA or somewhere, I just go up on stage and do, tell jokes, and I improvise, do crowd work, maybe tell a story. But if, you're, if but, people are paying top dollar to come see right, you so in a theater. If, if you come see me in a theater, then that's where I, I have the large pad for part of the show, which of course comprises only maybe 10 minutes of a 90 minute show. Mm -hmm. And I'll play guitar for maybe the last 15 minutes, just finger pick and talk over it. I mix it up because for me, I think, if I'm sitting in the audience and I have to watch 90 minutes of these little pieces, how can, how can time move in the best way possible so that it doesn't move very slowly and I get bored? How do I? How do I, as the performer, keep the audience engaged enough? Even if I think all the jokes are worth telling. And how do you? One way I found for me was if I chunk them, if there's a beginning, middle, and end to these pieces, it's like each joke's a little brick. Mm -hmm. I've said this in interviews before, but for me, it's like if I get a joke that works, I feel like what I have is a building block. I have a brick of something that's valuable to me. Now I can make a tower, a small house, a fence, a well, whatever. You can make different things, obviously, with bricks. So, I just try to figure out where it goes. Does it go in what chunk? a run? Yeah, and I also found for me, if I stop, no matter how well it's going, and I just leave the jokes, every 15 jokes or so, and talk to the audience, that's a better show. Mm -hmm. Even if I don't know what I'm going to say, I just improvise. I just try to trust myself and just be present and pay attention to the room. So it's not a recitation, you know what I mean? I'm just like, to make comedy instead of reciting comedy, mm -hmm. Which is interesting for your Lenny Bruce situation. That's exactly you have to make comedy in that situation. It's not going to work if you're reciting comedy. Right. You're in trouble, I think, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what I try to do. Is I, I just try to keep figuring out how to make comedy. Um, so if I chunk stuff, that helps. If I improvise, I think that helps. Um, oh, but I was going to say this. With the drawings, my first sta stand-up special, the first thing I ever got to do on TV, I think, was Premium Blend. It was this show right. on Comedy Central called Premium Blend. They don't call it that anymore. It's it, something else. It, I think it's John Oliver's Yeah, so John, yeah, yeah, John Oliver has this thing. Right. Uh, and then I did Conan around the same time. It was in 2000. I got to do a five-minute spot on both of those things. Then I got to do a Comedy Central Presents that f taped in 2003, came out in 2004. And when I did that, they said, you'll do, you'll do uh, you know, 26 minutes, and we're going to air 22 of them. And they tell all the comics, you do 22 minutes, we take it in the edit, we cut it down, and then we go, it goes on TV. Well, I went to my friend's tapings. I went to, I, for the two years before I got one of those, I got to go to the tapings. And you know as a comic, you know your friend's bits, you see your friends, you know that's his closer, he's got this tag on that joke, you mm -hmm. know. And I'd go, I see Louis C.K., I see Louis Black doing his, I see, um, I think maybe Ted Alexander. I'm trying to think of guys, all these guys I knew, all New York guys. And then I'd see their special, and they take the guy's closer, and it's the ending of the second commercial break. Oh, yeah. And I'm thinking, oh, man, they moved his bit. They took his tag. They took the ending of that joke out. Or they take the middle of somebody's joke out. Well, as a comic, you, that middle is in there for a reason. Right. This is part of your timing. This is like your rhythm, you know? You're building a bridge, what have yeah. you. Yeah. 
I'd be like, oh, that sucks. I'd feel bad for them. Even if the special came out, well, I'm not talking about Louie. I'm, I'm trying to think of people. I can't remember specifics. I'm just saying if I'd seen 25 people do them, I'd see this in a lot of them. So the time came for me to get a special, and I said, yeah, sure, I'll do a special. But I realized it's four acts. There's four, there's four breaks, the ending, you know, two in the middle, whatever. Uh, so I'll, I'll just structure my show myself. So I'll do straight stand-up in the beginning, because that's what I mostly do to show people I'm a stand-up. I, I, I just tell jokes. That's what I do. And I'll know that they're going to fuck with that. If they fuck with anything, it's going to be that. They're going to fiddle with that. I can't control that. You get no access to the edit. Right. This is your material you've been working on for however many years. Too bad. Yep. An editor is going to decide your timing, your rhythm, your jokes. You know? Who's never performed stand-up in his life. Right. right. On purpose. They, they handpick people who hate comedy. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. To be severe. So. No. So I know, all right, I can't control that. Second thing, I tried this bit with his drawings a couple times. Because I have drawings in my notebooks anyway, it worked. Great, I'll put the drawings in there. Now, if you want to edit me, you're going to have to find a break in my stand-up, and you also are going to have to... It's going to be hard to pull up a whole joke out of the drawings, because now you're not going to be able to use a wide shot. Right. So you're going to have to go on a tight on me, if you want to take out that bit. Like, to make it look not clunky, mm -hmm. like, I, I gain control there. You learn and I have a closer. I, it says the end. I dictate when we go to commercial. You learned how to edit. I had to edit like in camera, basically, for myself. That's how I did. That was second act of my special. Third act, I, had, I recorded a waltz on the piano I played. Put it on a boombox. Press play on the boombox. And I have a guitar. So every now and then, I'm like hitting the guitar as I'm telling my jokes. Now you want to cut my jokes in the third act? You got to find a break in the waltz. Make sure I'm not strumming the guitar and a break between the jokes. So good luck pulling my jokes up in there. Then I get to stop the music, I go to commercial. Last act, I have my friends come out in costumes and whatever, and again, people come out and they're on stage, so it's harder to cut. Right. So that was, that, the, the effect was when my special aired, sure enough, the first act, they changed the order of some of my jokes and stuff. The rest of it, untouched. Right. was the way I performed it. And I got my special to go on TV. The stakes were raised, I didn't get any rehearsal time. I did a bit, you're talking about, you did your bit for the first time. My friend's coming out in costumes, a stupid thing I did. I never did it before. It's not a bit I used to do. <laughs> first time I'm doing it, it's the closer to my special. I was like, oh, this is, I get one shot at this. I hope this works. You right. know? But I also realized they air the shit out of those. So I was like, all right, if, I'm, if mine looks a little different, maybe when it airs, it will serve me a greater purpose. Stand out. It'll stand out in some way. My jokes are generic anyway, so you can air it for five years. Right. And so, yeah, sure enough, I started to get colleges and stuff because of that special. But I outsmarted myself because then I go do my regular stand-up and I go to gigs and they'd be like, where's the drawings? Yeah. What do you mean, where's the drawings? You're the guy with the drawings. <laughs> oh, I, I only did that like a few times and one of them was on TV. You're the guy with the drawings. <laughs> you have a close-up camera? <laughs> You're the guy with the drawings. Yeah, I'm man. like, okay, I'm the guy with the drawings. So <laughs> Back so, at the hotel. Fuck! <laughs> right. right, so now when I'm in my rider when I go to gigs, theaters, or whatever, I have like the weirdest rider. It's like... Green and Black's chocolate bar, roast beef sandwich, one large pad, 18 by 24 inches, you know, with this kind of thickness paper. It has to have a certain thickness, the paper, because if it's too thin, you can see the next drawing, then you can see the next joke coming. So I seem like this total weird kind of drawing prima donna. So that's like kind of in my rider. <laughs> yeah. You know, I have to have a certain kind of pad. So we didn't realize we booked Picasso. Right. And then when I did my, the longer special, Dimitri Martin Person, well, now I got to control it. So now all those things I was doing so that, like, yeah, they can't pull up my drawings. And, like, good and luck like, breaking fuck, I can't edit this. Right, I couldn't edit myself. <laughs> I said, oh, God, <laughs> bit me right in the ass. Like, now I can't edit my, sh my own shitty joke I want to take out. <laughs> yeah. I can't edit myself. It's I'll just show so funny. him. That fucker, both you. It's just funny. That, yeah, exactly. The lessons you learn, it's just so funny. You can really only learn from experience. You know the check spot in a club? The check spot. I don't know if, if you guys know this, but when I started, I didn't know what the check spot was. And at least in New York, when I started, the check spot was one of the comics on stage is going to, that night, is going to be on stage when they drop the checks on everybody's tables. Mm -hmm. So you're in the middle of your set. If nobody's ever told you about the check spot or you never experienced it, you're on stage, you're having a good set, the crowd's with you, and then you lose them. All of them. They just turn on you. Yeah. As far as you know, what the fuck? Uh, yeah. You guys, what happened? Like, and you see comics get mad. You know, especially the tough guy in New York comics. You know, fuck you people, whatever. Nobody told him. 
hey man, they're, they're just doing math. They're trying to pay their bill. <laughs> they still like you. They just can't laugh. And how much do I owe? <laughs> that's you can't do it at the same time, you know what I mean? It's a multitasking thing. It's a thing, multitasking right? thing, yeah. But that's just so interesting. I had to incorporate something into the act that dealt with that. That night? Yeah. No, I mean, I've been doing it now for oh, years. Oh, just generally? Yeah. And it's almost like a stock heckler comeback. But right. I've developed a thing. When you're doing an hour or more, and they are handing out checks if you're in a venue that has that, mm -hmm. you know, you can either ignore the fact that everyone is now right. ignoring you. <laughs> right. Which is like being a figure skater who <laughs> fell and is like still smiling. Like you can't, it's crazy. You can't do that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, especially if you're telling stories. Um, you, 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 you have a connection. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. So, so you have a bit though. So if they drop the checks, you know when that's coming and at least you can incorporate it yeah. or you have a bit about that. I incorporated that. it into a bit that now actually kills. Which is great. It's like, I, that's one of my favorite things about getting to do stand up for a while. Is that there's a larger body, there's a larger work kind of. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There's like a joke, which becomes a 10 minute chunk maybe, right. which is part of a special, but it's part of a career. And then you, you learn how to, I think, use the stage and be, pay attention. When I started, I don't think I looked at the people as much. Right. But now, I, a lot of times I do, if the lighting's right, which I think freaks people out if you look right at them. Yeah. People don't want that. Or I, I always. <laughs> why, my, it's always fun. It's strange when you do decide to make eye contact, and you know that thing where, and I think you actually just did it, which is someone's talking, you're listening to them, and you you nod yeah. your head like I'm here, I'm listening, yeah, and I'm actually responding. <laughs> Sorry, you look at somebody in the audience. <laughs> they're going. These are doing. Oh, I I totally do that. I read this interesting book that talks about how you can be oriented the way you receive content in the world, the way you process information, primarily auditorily, visually, or kinesthetically. Everybody is going to be one. Everybody's all three, but there's kind of a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So some people are more visual and they can, the way they listen is by looking. And the way they feel like they're listened to is if somebody looks at them. Right. And the way, you know, they're, and they're often maybe have more of a sense of their personal style, how, how, how colors go together. Those kinds of things matter more to them, in a sense. Right. Whereas another person might be more auditorily tuned. Mm. So the eye contact doesn't matter. I'm more auditory. I figured out when I read this book. If I'm talking to somebody at a party or something, if we're having a conversation, I'm just, you know what I mean? I'll be like, I'll give you the ear. Like, I'll look at the floor. <laughs> and I'm listening, uh-huh, uh-huh. You know, if I'm trying to figure something out, I look away. Like, it's not so locked in. If I'm aware of it, then I can do it. So Kinesthetic. So at a party, you've never heard someone say, that guy's a dick. No, I've heard him say it. I just haven't seen him say it. <laughs> 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 I've seen my glass say, this guy thinks I'm a dick. <laughs> that, or a kinesthetic. You know, like I have friends who will, they'll, you know, you meet somebody for the first time, they're grabbing your shoulder and stuff. Nicholas at the Warner thing was a toucher. I don't know if you noticed in the showroom there. He Is would that right? Because I saw him at one point make that contact thing like, like, you know what I'm talking about. Instead yeah. of saying that, they'll give you a little tap. Right. Yeah. I think I it's that, interesting. No. Like, I, yeah, whenever I, 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 talk, I do that to people when I'm talking to them. It's I a do, nice I thing. I don't know. I think that sort of connection is nice. And I, Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think it's interesting to be aware of it. And as a performer, then, I just think of people in the audience. Some people respond to things more visually. Right. Some people like the sound. I think it's, it's a shortcut to them. It's more like music or something. You know? Yeah. It's like different ways. Um, other than the 27-minute wait, to begin our conversation. Which was I enjoyed. Can you believe we're uh, two hours and ten minutes into this? Sorry, I, I, I warned Kevin before that I could be verbose. I don't think you understood the question. <laughs> I'm actually no, it's not. No, good. it's good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think you said it in a bad way. I, uh, I like it when time slips away and we're actually having a conversation. That's the perfect totally. outing for this show. Not in life. I hate it in life. No. In life, that's surgery. <laughs> it's weird. No, but um, I, I, this has been so great, honestly, in the sense that uh, I have a lot more pages of questions and we never got to them, like the stuff you did for The Daily Show and that sense of being able to do your own thing on a show that is so mathematically designed. Yeah. Beautifully, but very uh, strident in its delivery and execution. And to be an original thinker outside of that box and to have them say, we want you to do that. As a moment of um, 
trajectory in terms of accomplishments and, and moments you look back on it must have been kind of a cool challenge yeah to want to fit in to a show like that and then also to be asked don't uh, don't try to fit in that was a cool challenge it was interesting because at that time I quit Conan and then I was doing this one man show and it did well for me and then I did I was you know doing more stand up and stuff then I got a call that SNL they wanted me to test so they were going to fast, fast track me to the final, you know, 10 people they're going to hire four or something. And around that time, then The Daily Show was also saying, do you want to, maybe, you know, you can come in and meet. So I told my manager at the time, I was like, all right, well, cool, I'll, I'll go audition. I didn't realize, it, first of all, that the SNL thing was, if you go in the room and you get the job, you're locked for like seven years. Right. You know, unless they want to fire you, but you have no choice. I thought it was you audition, then you can decide, do I want to do this or not, you know, if you did get it. <laughs> right. And my, my manager didn't do his homework. He didn't tell me, so I had to ask him, and it was the day before. I said, just make sure I can turn this down if I don't want it. And then he called me back. He said, you can't. So but, if you go in the room. Right. So I said, okay, then can you tell him that I'd like to just make short films for them or something? Right. Because I don't want to do that. I don't want to test, because I'm not sure what I want to do for seven years of my life. And he said, I'll try. He called them and he called back. He said, they didn't like that idea. They got pissed off. Yeah. They're like, you don't tell us. Like, we have a system. This like, is how you do it. Go yeah. fuck yourself, I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, no. <laughs> I mean, you don't tell us wrong, you're going to make short films for us. You know, you, don't, you audition, and if you get picked, you, there's a contract. It's locked in seven years. This is the steps, you know. I think that, that was one of those moments I was asking about before yeah. where you take the reins of your destiny and say, I actually would rather do it this way. Yeah, I didn't even think of, but yeah, you're right. So that, that was one I said, no thanks, so I never went in. And then I went and met at The Daily Show, and then that led to... Uh, and The Daily Show, the opposite, said, please do whatever you'd like. Yes, they said, we, we like your stuff, and I said, I'm psyched you guys called me in. I do very little material about politics, and I know very little about it. And or even topical. Topical, yeah. I just, I, it's not my thing, so I don't really know how I fit here, but if I can do something, that'd be great. So they said, well, why don't you brainstorm some ideas and come back in a week? and tell us what you got. And I, I had three or four ideas. Trend spotting? Trend spotting. I dated a girl briefly who was a trend spotter. That's how I found out about trend spotting. I was like, wow, this is cool. So I, I, I gave him trend spotting. I was going to be a college reporter was one of my ideas, that I would just do reports about actual college news stories. Because if you read college newspapers sometimes, it's really funny. <laughs> well, there'll be world news, and then there'll be like somebody vandalized the dining hall. <laughs> It's like somebody stole all the desserts from the time. Right next to the Qaddafi? Yeah, it'll be like something in Afghanistan. Then, like, who keeps taking the desserts? You know, like it's one per person, you know, whatever. It's like, it's just so interesting. But Stop wanted, banging my locker. Right. I want to do that as like real news. So that, that, they didn't go for that. You know, there was a few other ideas. So they said, we like the youth thing and um, trend spotting. So then write one. Why don't you find a trend, write about it, and then we'll shoot it. So I did. So I got to do seven or eight of them. So it was a good little run. They were really nice and accommodating to me. Yeah. And, and you was, found a producer on that that yes. you worked with a lot. Rory Albanese, who's now the executive producer there. He started there as a PA years ago, and he continued to work and worked his way up, which is such a good story in showbiz. You know how we can get pigeonholed and oh, stuff. Oh, God, yeah. But he's done really well for himself, and he's a funny guy. So, yeah, I had fun working with him. That was cool. Yeah. You'll have to come back. People will have to rush right out and get themselves a copy of This is a Book. Mm, you'll like it, or, or you you won't like it that much, but one of those you will. And they can go to your site and see some tour dates, right? Yes. Uh, oh man, thanks. I appreciate it. I'm bad at the... Is it Isn't it funny that there's a difference between making stuff and selling stuff? Yes. It's just it's very tricky to get good at both. You did not uh, spend a lot of time in the marketing class. <laughs> exactly. At the, Yale. That's right. I just now waited two hours and 15 minutes to let everyone know that you graduated from Yale. Did I say that it in the introduction? In the intro. It was in the intro. It was in the intro. But it was cool. It was cool. Um, I did, but it was cool. <laughs> <laughs> I also love uh, in, in, in reading about you how you were saying that, you know, it was really hard to get into Yale, but then once you were there, it was incredibly easy to get a B. 
there was a lot that, less work involved. It you, did seem like you that. You just kind of wanted to get by with a B, which of you, of course, got A's, but... Granted, I wasn't in sciences, so maybe in the sciences it's different. But for the liberal arts stuff, at, when I was there, I'm putting all these qualifications on it because people were like, fuck you, you know. But yeah, when I was there, it was like... Hey, hard to get. Sir. Yes, <laughs> it's hard to get Steve Martin. <laughs> <laughs> what a dick. He comes in at the beginning and then back at the two-hour 15 mark. He wants that last name back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to get above a B, and it's kind of hard to get below a B. Yes. I mean, it's not that hard to get below a B, but if, I think if you tried a little bit, it seemed like people it gravitated towards Bs. Right. That was a long time ago when I was there, but I had a good time there, and I had a lot of their sweatshirts. They got a lot of money from me, and I think mm -hmm. it worked out well for everybody. Nice. Uh, I have given you all this time to, to contemplate a Larry King game. You oh, were right. warned ahead of time. That's right. Uh, if you'd like, I'll go over the rules again. Yes. Well, let me just say, DimitriMartin.com is where the info for my touring in book is. Yes, okay. please go to DimitriMartin. All right, give me this Larry King thing. All right. um, those of you struggling with the spelling of Dimitri, um, stop watching this show and never come back. <laughs> D-E-M-E-T-R-I. Thank you. Um, Martin, as it's always spelled, dot com. Uh, for tour dates and also the book and everything else, it's a, it's a pretty cool website also. And a lot of the drawings are up there. And uh, we wish you nothing but tremendous success, thank my you. friend, honestly. And thank you and Jason Antoon. Thank you, Jason. For uh, The for, silent Antoon. For making this possible. <laughs> you can talk now, yeah. Go ahead. Well, you can talk, but no one will hear you. Go ahead. Just I mean, speak by really no one, I mean the people in this room. Pick you, up. Um, you can no, mime it, nothing. but there's no camera on uh, Now, if this goes well, let me just say that we will pass it along to Larry King. No. Uh, so this is your camera. The rules, again, I want a bad Larry King impression. Okay. And then, again, it's just that too much information moment about Larry before he goes to the phone. And if the name of the city is funny sounding that you go to the phone for, that's also helpful. Okay. Doesn't have to be. I might do a couple. I might sure. Take, it might take me a couple. Get right in there. But that's your camera when you're ready. So I've seen Larry King a few times, mm -hmm. so... He has he has a mug. Yeah. He usually does right behind right. Sure. And he's to camera. Mm hmm He's kinda of leaning forward, right? A little bit. He's kind of a thin thin guy. Does that make me skinnier? <laughs> I'm not sure you could be skinnier, but sure. I look like Blossom, man. I don't look like Larry King. <laughs> be be more self aware. That's right, that's right. <laughs> At least my reference, that's from, that's... 80s. Back to the, back to the 80s. 80s. Late 80s, 80s early 90s. I'm almost, I almost made it to the present. Okay. <laughs> my last question is... Sure. He says the name of the city at the end. Yes, he does. Uh, too much information moment, then right to the phone. Okay. As if that's, there's no so second he's just finished the conversation. He's, he's coming out of the conversation. Okay. Could be. Uh, <laughs> nice! You're already there! <laughs> there's the bad liar king. But... That's perfect. Uh... uh <laughs> I've got pus in my shoes, <laughs> Sheboygan. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you need a second take, okay. I'm going to be honest with you. You get, you get high marks on all fronts. Uh, the lackluster impression, perfect. <laughs> the economy of words, again, mm. keeping true to yourself. There we go. And your own art form. And then Sheboygan, hard to beat as a town. That's, it sounds that funny. That works nice. Yeah, yeah. All be beautiful and it's lovely. got the K sound in it. And sure enough. The hard K. Um, thank you very much. Thank Honestly you. Honestly and truly. That was so fun. Uh, that is the best uh, that I hope for. And so, really, thank you. Um, it, it, it was awful fun for me, so it's good to hear that it's mutual. Uh, you, you sit there uncomfortably now while I wrap things up Great. to the camera. Let me, let and me then back you'll off. be done with the uncomfortable part of the Thanks for having me, man. Day. That was fun. Thank you very and much. And thank you again to Jason Antoon. This is a, a triangle between me, you, right? and Jason. The Jew. <laughs> <laughs> Jason wants the twenty dollars for that. The did not and get picked up on mic. Shortly out of camera range, for those of you at home, just said, "I'll take the twenty dollars." And here he is, literally over here. Go this way. Let's see your hand. <laughs> <laughs> From one swarthy man oh, to another. Oh, how dare you, sir? Oh. This is a family program. <laughs> and the ultimate, the, the Jew, ultimate sign off. You can say the Jew, the Greek, and the Arab. Yeah, I was going to say that. We are the three amigos. Three hairy amigos. Uh, three hairy amigos to block. All right. Um, uh, thanks to everyone uh, for, A, for giving us our two-week absence and staying in uh, there to wait for us to return. Uh, those of you uh, who are checking us out on the iTunes and the various after 
uh, live show opportunities. Tell everyone you've ever met about Kevin Pollock's ChatShow.com. We do have some pretty uh, pretty cool people coming up. Go to the Kevin Pollock's ChatShow.com uh, schedule page at our website to find out who's coming up. People like Rob Reiner, uh, Eugene Levy. I want to remind Ooh. people about the Rob Reiner. We're pre-taping it this Wednesday. Pre-taping so Rob Reiner. Get all your questions in by then. We're doing a couple of pre-tapes. He'll be on Easter Sunday, so we're going to pre-tape yeah. him Wednesday. We're Wednesday. Con continuing the tradition of Jewish guests on Easter Sunday. Yes. We're three for three now. That's great. <laughs> Just to remind people. Three for three. And Good. Jesus, wasn't it three days when he came back? Yeah, Indeed. You're right. Yeah. You're right. Nice. Rule yeah. of three. And the, it's an old rule. <laughs> even, Jew, even Jesus knew. Well, he was a Jew. So it was in his DNA. Right. He knew the rule of three jokes. Um, in the meantime, of the five, uh, uh, two hours and 21 minutes, uh, the crew has been working outside these hallowed walls. And one has to wonder, with two weeks off, uh, when it comes to what we now to, uh, have come to know and love as the crew gag that takes place at this point, I wonder, after two weeks of time to think about what their crew gag might be, what it might look like. Oh, during the day. Back off the plate. Oh, it's like softball. Back off the plate. It's got audio. She's crowding the plate. All right. Uh-oh, this could go oh, bad. No. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's fantastic. It's still got. Uh, I. Uh, <laughs> well, I had no idea our crew gag budget had gone into the millions. Hey, what? Amazing! Now we know where the boat flex money went. This is insane. <laughs> Job well done. There was a base. There was a softball game, and I heard tell that the crew gag may have been shot. Uh, at the softball game. Well, nice job. Nice job, everyone. That was hilarious. And again, uh, we're very concerned about the budget. Uh, and thank God Fred Savage wasn't here to yell at, uh, <laughs> at, the, at, the, at the shoot and critique it instantly, <laughs> as he did a couple of weeks ago. Um, so stay with us. We'll be back uh, each Sunday bringing you either a pre-tape show or a live show. But go to the calendar of the schedule to see who's coming up. Also, uh, uh, Sam's friend, Damon... Damon Lindelof. Lindelof, uh, you're a person from Lost and mm -hmm. also writing the Star Trek uh, 2. Mm -hmm. and, and also from Star Trek, John Cho. John Cho, speaking of Star Trek, our new Mr. Sulu, as well as um, the, uh, the movies uh, Harold and Kumar, I'm guessing he's Harold. Um, I think so. Yeah. I think so. So check the schedule, as I said. Thank you very much for uh, tuning in, as always. Uh, are there any thanks I'm leaving out? I feel like we've been away so long I've forgotten something. I'd like to thank the people of uh, Paris, France. Sammy would like to thank first all of for the people. Being, well, most of them. But first for being awesome and then for uh, robbing me. <laughs> Even the three pricks on the train that robbed you? Even the three pricks. And what'd they get out of you again? Uh, 80 euro. Want to do the math for us? 115 bucks. 115? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Visa. <laughs> <laughs> They're not a sponsor. Until next week, and as always, get out of my face. He's all of the rainbows, but none of the rain. He's He's scared.